Nasikiza yale ambayo yanaweza kuinua mioyo zao asubuhi ya leo. Hey. Sawa basi. Hey. Did you get caught up in the snow yesterday? Hmm? Did you get caught up in the Nairobi snow? No. Mm. There was such a thing yesterday. Yeah. Mm. What happened? There was a hailstorm. And of course, you know what happens is uh, Kenyan said it is snowing. Yes, it's snowing ice. Mm. No. So some parts of uh, Nairobi apparently actually had hail, a proper hailstorm. The southern bypass around the areas along the Ngong Forest. Mm. There was rain. Mm. That one, yes, a, a lot yeah. of it. Yes. And it was actually torrential. Mm. That one I experienced. Mm -hmm. But you know the snow, you had me thinking there, well, I mean, where was I yesterday when it snowed? <laughs> so that was it. Had you temporarily left Kenya is what you were thinking. I mm. actually just thought, I wondered, snow. Then I realized, no. What? Anyway, I was waiting for an explanation because I certainly did not experience any snow. Any kind of snow? No, but I did experience, there was rain. Heavy rain. Uh, it was serious. Heavy, heavy rain. Mm -hmm. But then it was also in just some parts yes, as well. Yes, yes. There are some parts that did not have experience. Uh, that but it also didn't last very long. Sure. It was just a brief one. Eh? Yeah, but hey, if it got you, mm. man, it got you. <laughs> yeah, I was somewhere around the Bilimani area around that time. Um, it, and It rained. It rained, but it was just about five minutes. Yeah, then it stopped. But it had rained. For, the, the, the five minutes rain was a five-hour rain. Mm. Mm. It Yani, it fell. Because it's like, suddenly, it got dark quickly. Yes. Then it started petering, then it just fell. Yeah. But I would, should, should I say it didn't fall, it collapsed. Yeah. It just collapsed. Yes. It started Loudly. falling out of the sky. Yeah. Yeah. So, welcome to the show, everybody. Today, we'll have more interesting conversations to have. Uh, in addition to looking at the newspaper headlines, we will be looking at the plight of locusts. Where are they? So, just the other day, I saw our friend Mohamed Elia, who will be joining us tomorrow morning, um, posting some pictures, saying some video clips on social media, saying that he had witnessed locusts in... Uh, what's that border town called? Which border town? In Kajiado County. Namanga. Namanga. Yes. <laughs> I was thinking, mm. yeah. Yeah. So Namanga, apparently there were locusts. Uh, people have said they've seen locusts in other parts as well. So we'll have a conversation about locusts and what the government has been doing to deal with the locust invasion. We'll be joined by government spokesperson, Colonel, retired Colonel Cyrus Aguna. He'll be here. And then we'll also have a conversation. Today is what the newspapers are calling Super Tuesday. 22 counties are going to be debating the BBI amendment bill. And uh, we'll have a conversation around that because now it emerges that governors are saying, uh, I know there's no money here. Yeah? So are MCAs uh, feeling duped? <laughs> or are they okay with what's happening? Are they, <coughs> the promise has been made it will come with interest when it comes. So we'll discuss that as well. And clinical officers are still on strike. They are. Doctors? They want to beat the doctor's record. Eh? <laughs> being on strike for the longest period of time mm. or being resilient uh, in terms of what they're asking for and kind of recognition that they're, they're seeking. Mm. But I guess that's one thing that they are. They're still on strike. Hey, so we'll discuss that. Clinical officers still on strike. That means many health facilities in the country not well manned. So what does that mean? And what's the way forward then? So those are the conversations we'll be having. In addition to looking at the spread of COVID-19 in the world, in Africa, in the country, where do you want to start? Okay, well, let's look at the world a little bit. 112 million cases, what we're looking at now. 112,258,917. The world has almost reached 2.5 million deaths that uh, can be attributed to COVID-19. We are um, looking now at the United States having lost over half a million people to COVID-19 related deaths. 28,826,307 is the numbers that the U.S. is looking at right now. 
now also we're getting into a, the world is getting into an interesting time where the seasons are changing and we're looking at flu season beckoning in the united states word out now is that they expect the cases of covid-19 to rise combined with that which is happening uh, when flu season kicks in spring is coming soon in a month or so the seasons will change and um, they're expecting <clears throat> high numbers. 59,257 is the number of cases that were recorded in the U.S. yesterday. 1,374 deaths. Um, so that's what's going on there. And uh, still tra really racking up in terms of the vaccinations that they can do with the doses that are available for COVID-19 in the U.S. Some variants, of the second, some variants have been found in the U.S. as well across states. Isolated cases in some. But this is what they are looking at. Let's look at the UK, who is set to open up now in the next week or so. Um, the UK has been on a steady decline in terms of reporting of cases of COVID-19. Um, yesterday, 10,641 new cases, 178 deaths is what was recorded. We understand that they've been on lockdown since December. And it was said that this would remain until March now, they are currently looking at plans on how they will now begin uh, to open up. Um, Boris Johnson is to unveil a cautious plan, is what they're calling it, to lift England's lockdown. All schools in England are set to reopen on the 8th of March. Um, so he's got a four-part plan to lift the coronavirus lockdown. From the 8th of March, all schools will open and activities will be allowed. There will be recreation in public spaces. Um, they will be allowed between two people meaning that they were able to sit down and have a coffee or a drink. Uh, the 29th of March, then outdoor gatherings for six people or two households will be allowed. And they're very clear about this and how it's supposed to be. Mm -hmm. And they're making sure that, you know, anybody who's responsible um, for making sure that this happens is in line and doing what they need to do. So they're looking at this per date and they're even counting down to the numbers what they're going to be able to allow. Mm. Now that they've seen a reduction in the numbers, and this was their plan all along to say that by... March, that they would then allow things to go back to normal. Children will go back to school. How are people reacting when uh, they hear that the first, among the first uh, to be reopened is schools? Well, um, in terms of reaction... Looking at the kind of debate we're having here, you know, uh, schools are reopening, why? Why now? Mm. Well, we, we understand that schools had opened before in the UK. Yeah. They had gone back to school, September, October, and then this lockdown happened, so they went back home. Now, um, from what we see, folks are ready to go back to school. Children, teachers ready to go back to teaching. Because I'm looking at it from this angle. So all schools are going to reopen. Yes. Many schools in England are not boarding schools. Mm. So you'll have children basically going to school and coming <coughs> back home in the evening, mm -hmm. but you're restricting the number of people who can sit and have coffee. Mm. <laughs> yep, just two people having a coffee at uh. least until the 29th of March. Uh depending on what they see. So with all the necessary precautions taken now that in the UK, everybody was, must wear a mask. Interestingly, except children under the age of six. Children under the age of six in the UK will not be required to wear a mask to school, those mm. above the age. I mean, they're, they're looking at things like um, uh, restrictive restrictions to breathing or when they're yep. in play and things like that, yep. that they will not be able to handle it on their own in case something goes wrong. So they'd, they'd rather uh, risk them not wearing a mask than wearing a mask that could bring about ventilation problems. But also, if you look at the research findings, mm. children are really not at that great a risk as adults when it comes to contracting the virus. Mm. It's just a simple truth. Mm. It's just that you need, they are spreaders of it, but they themselves may not necessarily be adversely affected. Mm -hmm. sure. But then there's this debate, really, even as you open up. Many countries have opened up schools, shut them again, opened them, shut them again. Mm. Now, even somewhere, they've been taking the precautions that are necessary. So essentially what comes out is that, again, the virus and it, the wherewithal around it is not fully understood because you seem to be doing certain things. And despite that, see, the same debate now is going to be brought to the discussion around Tanzania. Because now, it, it's not what's just happening in Tanzania, but what will happen to its neighbors. See, these new variants of uh, COVID, when you don't check the spread, because this is what the restrictions do, you check the spread, okay? If you don't check the spread, then you are giving the new variants a field day, an opening, an opportunity to flourish. And if you look, say, for instance, at some of the things that we'll be discussing later, uh, 
what has happened, that the findings that Wellcome Trust and Cambria found with regards to, to truck drivers, you'll find that they found that close to half of the truck drivers that they tested mm. along the border of Busia, Malaba, tested positive. Truck drivers and their turn boys. Right. Now, so the neighbors of Tanzania are as at, are as, at, as great a risk as the Tanzanians themselves when it comes to the spread of COVID. I mean, just likening that to what you're saying now, and the question that you were asking is that you know um, teachers' unions in the U in the UK are actually worried about this. That they're saying that uh, the problem is not that whether children will have it or not, but that in terms of how they could actually spread it, right? So they're saying that it would be reckless to bring all pupils in England to school together on the 8th of March, um, and this is from the teachers' unions in the UK. They'd rather risk a spike in infections rather than risk another spike in infections. They're calling for a more cautious and phased return for the exact same reason that you're saying, that children uh, may not suffer from it very much, but it is possible that they would spread it. They're coming to school, they're going back home in the evening, and they, the, the, the teachers are the ones who would be at risk. So they're Saying, can they're asking, you know, can we have a phased, you know, reopening of schools whereby um, either you pick certain classes to come at a certain time and then others come on certain days? So, from the teachers' unions around the UK, and this is across board from Scotland to uh, um, England to Wales and Northern Ireland, they're saying, you know, what, can we have it in this manner where that where it's phased because they understand exactly this risk? Talking of risk. The um, American president, uh, Joe Biden, when he was making his speech with regards to commemorating the, the, the numbers who have passed away from COVID, he said that the deaths, the 500,000 plus deaths, are more than the collective deaths Americans suffered in World War I, World War II, and Vietnam. Mm. So it isn't a small thing. It is not something mild. And that they're leading. We're talking about 2.5 million uh, infection on the planet, yeah. they claim a fifth of that. That is not something to be talked about, to looked at lightly. It isn't. It is not a small thing. Mm -mm. Countries that have huger populations than America don't have those numbers. Mm. Countries that, would uh, you could argue, have less resources mm. than America don't have those problems. In fairness, though, those three wars that he's quoting were not fought in, on American soil. So you're just talking about a specific number of soldiers who've been sent out to go and fight the reason anyway, why he, he gives the example way. is mm. people expect, you're expected to die when you go to fight. Mm. Mm. <clears throat> you are more likely to die. Should I put it that way? Yes, but you're still, you're not going to send a million people to go and fight. Actually, if that is the case, Eric, then the numbers are even more alarming. Mm. Because if you do the maths, mm. then the number of people you send, and if you look at the fatality rate, mm. then you could say it is really very high. Because it's usually a factor of the numbers that existed before they actually went to war. Mm. Yes. Okay. So let's take a break then at this point. Uh, it's a quarter past six. This is Kenya's biggest conversation, the Situation Room. The live stream is up this morning, bright and early. Spice of MKE on YouTube, on Facebook and on Twitter. Let's see who is online today. We will be able to shout out to you so you can shout out at us. Okay. Let's see the weather, whether it's going to be raining stones again today. The rain of stones. Good morning. Twenty four seven around the world, nonstop. This is Spice FM. Spice FM. Oh, <laughs> it's getting hot in here. Oh, everybody steals. Mm -hmm. It's better a thief mm -hmm. who brings something small back. Mm -hmm. And I say to myself, there's no better thief. A thief is a thief, period. All those bribes, how much they are getting by her, how much inconvenience they are causing, as much as you call it a small case, it's worth it to be convicted. The truth is, we are a tribal nation. Because if we were not tribal, and I want to go back to this, mm -hmm. you cannot continue walking around with a mug which is clean outside and it's rotten inside. We have become a full laser country. Mm -hmm. We have mortgaged our country because of debt. You've got one chef working, mm -hmm. and the assistant chef, Wakati and Atekana, Kroge, Suka, Kroge, Unga, Nini, Ayuko, and This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. 
overnight, light rain in Nairobi this morning, 16 degrees at the moment. It's going to go to highs of 25 today and a chance of this rain to continue throughout well into early afternoon. It's mostly cloudy in Yeria at 12, highs of 23 and lows of 12. Cloudy conditions in Nakuru at 15 currently. 24 degrees the high today and lows of 14. It's a foggy morning in Eldoret at 13. That'll be the low for today, going to highs of 22. Mostly cloudy conditions in Kisumu, highs of 29 and lows of 20. We're looking at cloudy conditions in Kakamega as well. 15 degrees, going to highs of 28 and lows of 15. Partly cloudy conditions in Mombasa today at 25. That'll be the low as well, highs of 32. Uh, partly cloudy in Malindi at 25. 31 the high and lows of 26. We're looking at partly cloudy conditions stepping out of Kenya into Kampala. 19 degrees at the moment. Highs of 27. It's mostly cloudy in Dar es Salaam at 24. Highs of 29. 23 will be the high in Johannesburg today. It's mostly cloudy at 15 right now. It's a hazy morning in Lagos. 26 as the sun does come out. Highs of 34 and lows of 26. Look at a chance of rain later. Partly cloudy conditions in Kinshasa at 23. Warm high of 31. There's light snow happening in Beijing, at least. It's one degree this morning, highs of three only and lows of minus four. It's going to get pretty warm in Paris today as spring does beckon ever so slowly. 11 degrees and clear conditions, highs of 18 today and lows of nine. We'll see how that fluctuates later. Partly cloudy conditions in London at eight, highs of 13 and lows of 11. And finally, for now, New York Monday night is three degrees. Cloudy conditions coming into Tuesday. We'll see highs of four and lows of zero. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. Good morning. Who is online? Well, all right. Okiki Akinubosu says good morning. Uh -huh. Say that again. Okiki Akinubosu. Wow, wow. Yeah. It's a mm -hmm. beautiful name. Cyprian Mora says, good morning, guys. Tuned in from Nakuru County. Kip Koech Brenson is tuned in as well. From Juja, Moses Gashari says, good morning, good morning. And he says, BBI is passing while the health sector is in disarray and Baringo citizens are crying. BBI, it's a tattoo higher manenos, jolly. <laughs> oh, okay. Good morning, good morning. That's from Alan Joel. I'm thrown in that little tune for you. Spicing up Mombasa, that's Robin Bogo says, good morning. Kiplagat Misoy says, good morning, Muga Eric and Ndu. Good to see you guys. Good to see you too, man. Tuned in from Maseno. Waterman Jeffrey says, good morning, folks. Missed yesterday's conversation. Well, we're glad you're here today. Uh, Molly Yule Njipman says, good morning from Dandora. Mm -hmm. Arsene's Bond Forest. That's where Honorable Kiplimo Arab Kene is tuned in from. And Beda Ashley is representing Macha. Karibuni Kilamutu. Good morning, guys. And that's from uh, Sir Haran Wafula in uh, Kisumu. Mm -hmm. Shirage says, good morning, Wakurugenzi. Tuned in at the Kawa station, ready to board the Royal Eagle. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, City. Today's proverb. This is a proverb that's similar to one that I've mentioned in the past, like last year. Mm. But it has to do with not selling eggs, but rather carrying eggs. Okay. If you carry the egg basket, do not dance. <laughs> if you carry the egg basket, do not dance. No, do not dance. Mm. Think of something else to do, but don't dance. Okay. Pretty straightforward, that one, isn't it? So let's look at the headlines this morning. Mm. Yes. Right. So the nation believes that Ryla is a man under siege. Mm. Uh, so it seems that he's a marked man as well. As ODM leaders faces as an o, as ODM leader faces a barrage of attacks from the former allies in NASA, Deputy President William Ruto is using relatives to snatch his base, while key lieutenants in his Orange Party are going head on with him. So apparently there's something going on here. All right. So he's under siege. He's under siege, uh, as you would say. Okay. So. Yeah. Um, 
the former prime minister is under a barrage of attacks from his former allies in the National Super Alliance, NASA. Uh, Deputy President William Ruto is using relatives to snatch Odinga's base, while key lieutenants in his Orange Democratic Party are taking him head on. This is after Odinga gave the strongest indication yet that he may take another stab at the presidency in 2022 after his ruling out endorsing any of his former NASA co-principals. Uh, facing political heat from across the divide, he yesterday met his trusted lieutenants, in, including those allied to President Kenyatta, who want him to succeed as the head of state next year. He was hosted at the home of Central Organization of Trade Unions boss Francis Atwoli in Kajado in a high-profile meeting attended by Senate Minority Leader James Orengo, Jubilee Party Vice Chairman David Morave, and 2013 presidential hopeful Peter Kenneth. Mm-hmm. Others were National Assembly Majority Whip Emmanuel Wangwe and his minority counterpart, Junette Mohammed, as well as Mr. Wangwe's deputy, Maoka Maore. Okay. So they're confident that the 24-county constitutional threshold for the Building Bridges Initiative to proceed to the next stage will be achieved today. Allies said Mr. Odinga is already planning the next phase, chief among them countrywide tours to sell the referendum message. Mm. So they've said that from the 1st of March, they're rolling out countrywide tours to take BBI to the people. With all the signs, the assemblies will pass a document. We'll tell the people what is in the document and counter any propaganda out there. Okay, wait, pause. Where's the siege? Yes, this is, we're, we're getting there. So while he's under siege, the, what they're saying is that while he's under siege by these individuals, be it the deputy president and his former allies in the NASA uh, coalition, he is still going ahead and working on all of but this. But the question Eric is asking a valid one. Where is the siege? There's political movement... People are aligning themselves with people whom they think they need to align with. Mm. They are doing their normal political verbal rounds. They're making speeches. Where is the siege? Uh, I don't know. Maybe just because, so they, this is how they're saying, the nation, this is what they're saying. So Ruto uh, is using relatives to try and wrestle Nyanza. Mudavadi is going all out. Joho is applying to be the to get the ODM party ticket. Kalonzo has even issued that statement. Well, none of this really is siege per se, if you just think about it. Joho is the deputy party leader of ODM. He has not at any point said, I want Raila out. He's just basically saying, I want to apply for this seat. It's positioning, if you look at it that way. Mudavadi and Kalonzo. Yeah, they have walked out of the NASA coalition, but they've also spoken. So Kalonzo yesterday released a statement in response to Edwin Sifuna's statement. And Kalonzo him himself, he's saying, look, every coalition that this man has formed breaks immediately after an election. And the person to blame is Raila Odinga himself. So this is just, you know, that back and forth between them. They are keeping themselves busy in my casual reading, I don't see the actual siege where, you know, siege is you, 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 you have no exit. You know, it's a military term and every time it is used, it means someone is surrounded. Yes. Supplies have been cut, whether it is water, whether it is food, mm. you have nowhere else to go. Yeah. That is siege. Now, are we saying that the former prime minister has nowhere else to go? The answer is no. That he has no supplies. That he has no options. <laughs> no. no. That, that, that's yeah. tr- uh, wouldn't you say and do that they stretch it quite a bit? I would say that it sounded like a nice word to use without... Uh, it's a headline. Yeah. It's clickbaiting. Uh-huh. Well. Uh-huh. Okay. To get you to read the rest of it. This the is clickbaiting. Look, the same thing with the standard. Raila's hard tackle. Bare knuckle war once bosom <laughs> political buddies Raila Kalonzo and Mudavadi are swinging low punches at each other, tearing at the precarious tiny strings that still held the NASA house together. Yesterday, the ODM chief posted videos of the Wiper and NASA leaders appearing to contradict themselves amid equally strong volleys from them. Okay, yeah, those are hard tackles. Do these editors sit somewhere and compare headlines? Because the star, uh-huh. Raila's difficult option as NASA fall, NASA fall, uh, uh, fall out. Depends. Bass. <laughs> you know, this fallout did not start with a handshake. Mm-mm. No, 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 no. It, no. Started, it started before? Yes, it did. Or with the swearing in? Yes. Mm. And 
it appears that there's a narrative that wants to insist that that falling out, the so-called falling out in NASA, did not begin at that particular point in time. Mm. No. What is a coalition if it isn't the falling working? out was well, it began as soon as the coalition was formed. That is according to uh, Kalonzo. Mm. Yes. As soon as it was formed, it was basically just heading to fallout. The question I would ask is if that coalition had actually won the elections, would that fallout have taken place? Probably. We have another coalition that won elections and we are seeing. So it's not really difficult to imagine that it's possible that... No, 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 not possible, Eric. It's highly possible. Mm. Because uh, that falling out seems to be a trend we have in our history. Mm. Right from the time of independence. Mm. People agree? It's the order of the day. Fallout. I mean, it's clear that people come together for a temporary um, um, win or temporary victory. It's a means to an end. Coming together is just mm. to get you in the seat. Thereafter, it is very clear that uh, whatever joined you together <laughs> was quickly then put asunder. Because, but why uh, not just share the spoils of war and eat quietly? Because it wasn't genuine. The coming together is rarely genuine. That really, I want to see how we can work together. No. It's to be able to, <laughs> to, lo to lurch you forward. And then once you get into that place being forward, you realize that the foundation upon which you built this relationship that got you there in the first place wasn't really strong. If it was, you would not be having, you know. Or better still, I would, I would, I would say there's a, a di there's a different alternative perspective. People then actually follow the whims and the wind that they had actually had in mind. You see, not everybody says what they really have in mind when they're joining a coalition. No, yeah. no, you say what will help you be and, part and, and very parcel. Very few are joining this coalition because of the brotherhood uh, or the sisterhood. No, no, no. Joining All it the for people. their own individual. The, uh, desire or you, interest. You, you make and everybody wants more than they're saying. Absolutely. Yes, yes, Absolutely. yes. yes. So we are joining yes. hands here. Yeah, we're going to fight yeah, together. We'll work together, blah, blah, blah. But everybody is wants more. The Absolutely. point at which they may even agree, but ever so uh, briefly, mm -hmm. is on who is a torchbearer. Yeah. That they might agree. But you come in, everybody now wants to be torchbearer. Yes. Kwani? I contributed. Mm. I brought this. Well, even on the agreement of the torchbearer, it's a kind of agreement like, all right, y you have it now, but let's have the understanding that mm. at some point I'm going to throw my name into the into the ring. Mm. So let's. It's politicians. It's Kenya's politics. Twenty nine after six. Let's take a break. See what's happening on the roads, and then we continue with the headlines. Good morning. <laughs> This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Spice up your life. 24-7, around the world, non-stop. This is Spice FM. Spice FM, Melindy. All right, so we are looking at heightened levels of traffic already starting to form on Tika Road today, uh, already looking quite slow. Uh, Kiambu Road, yes, unfortunately, all we are seeing right now is a sea of red. Uh, it piles up and then trying to join at Muthaiga Square. It's going to be an issue today. So jam already very early and everybody's asking why. Yes, everybody's up at the same time trying to get where they're going. It's moving fast until survey and then survey it slows down quite some. All right. Unfortunately, there was again an accident on Thicker Road today, just past the Garden City flyover between a bus and another bus. Uh, so this one is going to slow things down right around there, at least for now. OK, remember that the demarcation is going on on Waiaki Way today. Uh, it was already uh, boarded up yesterday, so you can't use that particular area. You're trying to get to the bypass. Now is the time to leave. Uh, we want to be very careful, but you can use the Red Hill Bypass without too much of a headache. All right. Mombasa Road is piling up already and uh, getting to the Nyayo Stadium roundabout is going to be slow, but we'll wait and see how that looks like in about half an hour or so. Talk to us on Spice from MKE this morning. Text on 40127. Let's see how things are going to open up this morning, shall not we? Are you ready? Okay. Spice FM. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 24.4 Spice FM. Good morning to you. So in uh, 
the American political process during the campaign for the party tickets, the party primaries, is this thing that they call the Super Tuesday, right? Where key states are likely to vote, are going to vote and pick their preferred candidate in for whichever party. Now, today is Ch Super Tuesday in Kenya. And this is because we have 22 county assemblies today going to debate and vote on the BBI amendment bill. Those counties range from uh, Migori, Nyamira, to all the Mount Kenya counties, Meru, Embu, eh, Kirinyaga, Nakuru, eh, Kiabu, Muranga, Nyadarwa. Yep, the Mount Kenya counties are voting as, as a block. And then now we have the Narok, we have Bungoma, Kakamega, we have Taita Taveta, Mombasa, and Kilifi also voting today. In, and then Machakos, Kirinyaga, no, Machakos, Makweni, is a Ketui voting today. Yes. So, all those voting today. Yesterday we saw leaders, uh, MCAs from Makweni and Machakos had come together in Machakos. And this followed public participation fora that had been held um, in Makweni and Machakos. And the two governors urged the MCAs, okay, when we did the public participation, people said they are okay with the BBI and its proposals. So one of those who has been very vocal against the BBI lately and has even taken a case to court, to the Supreme Court, questioning on whether this is the right way to go about this particular process of taking us to a referendum, Governor Kivuda Kibwana says, I have listened to the will of the people. The people are saying yes. And I tell the MCAs, okay, guys, go ahead. I urge you to listen to the voice of the people. So in his previous statements, he had not been listening to the voice of the people? I don't think he has changed his previous statement, mm. in my opinion. Remember, when we talked to him, mm. there's something that he said. The spirit of what was the BBI, he didn't really have an objection. His objections came on certain very specific issues. Mm. And from what he said, what I gathered was, look, if these things are sorted out, then he has no objection. Mm. In my mind, those things have not been sorted out. Yeah. Or maybe they've been explained to him in a way that they hadn't been explained before. In the way that he did not understand them before, perhaps that is what has happened. Actually, sometimes it's not even a question of understanding. It is not about him understanding. No. This basically is a leader who is saying the people of Makweni County are Through their speaking leaders. with a very strong voice and saying, yes, they support the BBI. And he's come out there to say, now I urge the MCAs to support the BBI. I'm not sure he has said, I support the BBI. Nope, he hasn't. <laughs> and I'm also not sure that the queries he had mm. have been resolved. Mm -hmm. Someone doesn't go to court lightly. Yep. To the Supreme Court. Basically, he's saying... This is a process that has been started and is being sponsored by the executive. Mm -hmm. Can it be called a popular initiative? Mm. Popular initiative should start from the grassroots. It's a people, not sponsored by the executive. Yes. So this is the other way around. And he wants the Supreme Court to basically explain why we're going to a referendum through, through this route. Um, he has also been vocal and saying, why do we have to amend 78 uh, parts of this constitution. Why do we have to have 78 amendments to this constitution at a go? Not necessary. Um, I, so, yeah. Ndu, you're seeing like this is uh, flip-flopping. No, I'm just asking and I still am looking for an answer. <laughs> that, uh, before this, had the will of the people in his mind been taken into consideration when he was saying the things that he said before? Maybe in his uh, opinion, the will of the people had not been taken into consideration. Yeah. Now the people are saying, we... We are okay. Mm. We're fine. Sometimes if you are in a position of leadership and something as serious as this comes into being, mm. you as the leader, it is your job to query it because before you take it, the t your people will ask you questions. Yeah. Shouldn't you ask those questions first yeah. and say, folks, we're not clear about this, we're not clear about this, we're not clear about this. But more importantly, sort of voice, what are we getting? What is here? Yes. What exactly are we getting? Mm. Okay. The we here means the constituents in my county, mm. but the we here includes me because I'm also a constituent in that particular county. Yes. Yes. He it's actually has said that he has endorsed the BBI amendment bill. Mm -hmm. He did say that very clearly. 
I have listened to the voice of the people in the just concluded BBI public participation forums. The Wanainchi said the 15% revenue allocation to counties had greatly transformed rural economies. In that regard, I wish to respect the democratic will of the people and endorse the BBI amendment bill. I call on MCAs to respect that choice and approve it as well. So he has gone ahead and endorsed it. Mm -hmm. mm. When you endorse something, does it mean you no longer have uh, issues with it? I am looking at his tweet. It says, all those <laughs> things that you've said, that point of, in that regard, I wish to respect the will of the people and ask MCAs to do the same. No, no, no. There's the part that there's, there's more. There's a different tweet. The is it a tweet or a, uh, or a statement? Is it an interpretation or a quotation? Because I'm looking at his tweet, Kibuda Kibwana. I have listened to the voice of the people in the just concluded BBI public participation forums. Wanainchi said the 15% revenue allocation to counties had greatly transformed rural economies. In that regard, I wish to respect the will of the people and ask MCAs to do the same. And this one does MCAs not have this. to also respect the will of the people. Yes. Uh, this one does not say I, I endorse. Well, it does not have the word I endorse. There are many versions here. Mm. Yep. Mm. But he also goes ahead now to talk about when he's asked, okay, um, some Gabriel Dolan, uh, Father Gabriel Dolan asked him, no surprise after your handshake last week, Governor Kibwana. So are you going to withdraw your case in the courts? He says, we did a public participation as a county executive and fed the results to the county assembly who did theirs as the body mandated to pass or reject the bill. The majority approved BBI. I explained that was contract to my personal position, but I was bound by the majority. So he still says it was contrary to my own, but I'm bound by the majority. The majority are clearly saying, let's go. If the Supreme Court gives an advisory against my position, I will still disagree, but I cannot reject the court ruling. This is my understanding of democracy and the rule of law. If I reject the decision of the people of Makweni, my only option is to resign being their governor. So basically, this is a dissenting voice. He's basically saying, I had objections and I still have issues, but I'm bound by the majority. The majority seems to be saying, okay with BBI, so okay with the BBI. I will not withdraw my case in court. If the Supreme Court gives an advisory opinion against my position, I will disagree. That means he still holds that position. Okay. But he says, I cannot reject the court ruling. Mm. So I think Kivuda Kibwana is still in that position where he is not comfortable with the BBI, but he says, Misawa, kama nyinyi wote mnataka, okay, have it. Tutapatana mbele. Other counties that will be discussing this will have the MCA from uh, Kiambu County to come and we'll have this conversation again with him. Okay. Another headline, CT. Well, you know, the headline that actually caught my attention was something very interesting here. Mm. Um, something unique, something unusual. Giraffes dying mm. in a conservancy. Yeah. And dying for no other reason than that they They're have been tall. electrocuted. Mm. Now, those who don't know where Soy Sambo is, it's a near mm. okay. Kenya Power replaces poles after giraffe's death. Mm. Now, three giraffes died recently, but the total number of giraffes that have died have been 11. Okay? Mm -hmm. Kenya Power engineers yesterday replaced the short electric poles that led to electrocution of three giraffes in Soy Sambo Conservancy. The electrocution brought to 11 the number of giraffes that have been killed so far. Two male Rothschild species were electrocuted on Friday morning, while one died at the same spot on Sunday. Mature giraffes range, uh, that is the neck of course, 14 to 18 feet. That's the length. They didn't know this when they were putting up those poles. Giraffes. If we were told by Jaramogi that a giraffe sees far, it couldn't see this away. No. Why? It's long sighted, so, so this no, is why so it comes close I, to it. I'm saying no as I'm thinking. <laughs> what on earth are you just telling me? You think, okay, since you that is your response, let me ask you, you think the giraffes work for Kenya Power? <laughs> <laughs> why were they walking into a live wire? I'm just being facetious here, but. <laughs> well, I'm being equally facetious. <laughs> Well, the question that you asked, they, <laughs> they didn't know this. 
conservationists there are raising questions and saying, well, this matter had been raised several times, not just about the giraffes, but this particular area around the Soisambu Conservancy is actually a major migratory corridor it for is migratory, a migratory birds. Corridor. Yes, it is. And birds keep coming and hitting this particular and cable dying. and dying. And many have done the same. So it's a matter that has been raised by, you know, some conservationists, but this matter has had not gained momentum and had not even been taken up nicely by some of these organizations like Kenya Power, the county government, or even maybe pro probably even the management of the Soisambu Ranch, I'm not sure. But it brings to the fore an issue here that is uh, quite interesting. It is. What, does, what do Kenya Power now do with this line? Put an underground line. No, raise it higher. They've raised it higher. Birds. Yes. Put underground. I'm just going to follow your logic. Can the birds see? Hmm? <laughs> Listen, the thing that makes this... The birds air traffic controller should yes, tell exactly. them... Yes, exactly. They ought to when know. When you get there, 40,000 feet. Mm. Mm. The, this particular conservancy, mm. according to uh, a source that uh, preferred not to be uh, named, yeah. is that it has 150 species of uh, wildlife that are in the category of the endangered species. And this forms 10% of what that particular species has on the planet. Okay, The species of giraffes. Hey, this one. Which one is it? Rothschild? Or Rothschild. Rothschild. Uh -huh. Rothschild. Rothschild. So, it is not just a conservation issue. Okay? It is Kenya Wildlife doing what they do. And they're also saying that they have contacted mm -hmm. Kenya Power. Mm -hmm. uh, wildlife services on their part are still having a discussion with... You know me, this story of discussions really gets my goat. Mm -hmm. Eleven have died. You're still having a discussion. Let's discuss and see. As a result of this... Uh, low, yes, yes, this yes, 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 cable? yes. All of them walking to the power. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Then the the someone, died, some clever person also said that this last one which died must have smelled blood, mm. so it went. <laughs> I'm re it's actually in the paper. <laughs> so, but something that you may not know, mm. uh, animals mourn their dead. They do. They do. If one dies, you'll find them all congregating around. Congregate. They even run towards. And they, they don't do. realize what has cry. killed them. Yes. yes, they do. Mm. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Speaking of tears, schools panic as state yet to release exam funds. We know the exams are coming up in a short while. Mm -hmm. Some institutions don't have critical apparatus required for the KCPE and KCSE tests that are set to start from the 22nd of March. With only a few weeks to go, preparations for this year's primary and secondary school leaving examinations are hanging in the balance. I don't know if they're hanging in the balance, but okay. As the state is yet to release capitation balances. So this is the balance that they needed to have gotten until that point when the exams start. That has not happened. According to school heads, who are the managers of examination centers, uh, there are serious concerns over preparations for the 1.9 million candidates who will sit uh, the KCPE and Kenya and the, the KCSC exams, and they're expected to begin in four weeks. The school managers said the delayed release of the capitation balances by government is hampering purchase of chemicals for practical subjects and apparatus for science subjects. Uh, Kain Muli, who is the uh, Kenya Secondary School Heads Association chairman said thousands of Form 4 candidates may not sit the three, the three key science practical examinations if cash does not hit school accounts in time. So, of course, they need to buy uh, the materials for these exams because they are practical exams. As we speak, schools don't have money. This is what he said. The government promised to release the final tranche of 25% uh, by the end of February. That's uh, Sunday. This coming Sunday. Mm. Um, but they don't know if this is going to happen. He said that preparations for biology, physics, and chemistry papers may not be adequate if the government fails to release capitation money in time. Mm? Mm -hmm. So, 1,088,986 is the number of candidates who will sit the KCP exam. 699,745 is the number of candidates who will sit the KCSC exam. 19.2 billion shillings is the amount of money released to schools by state for the first term. And they're waiting for the balance of this money to come in. If it doesn't happen, we might have a problem. But we hope that it'll happen by the 28th. Wow. Mm. Mambo Epesa is, um, is, is, is a big one. Now, if you go to the back page of, this, of the nation today, 
County governments have the green light to borrow up to 60 billion shillings for development projects in a deal reached between the Intergovernmental Budget and Economic Council, IBEC, and the National Treasury. The Council of Governance Finance Chairperson, Derito Moridi of Laikipia, said in an interview that counties can borrow up to 20% of their last audited total revenue. The 60 billion upper limit is based on the financial year 2018-2019 audited revenues. So, if you look at now how much they are being told, so uh, revenue is for purposes of setting the borrowing ceiling defined as the share that counties receive from the treasury and their own generated cash that the regional governments raise from fees such as licenses and parking charges. The money can be used for capital projects as anticipated in the uh, fin Public Finance Management Act and the Constitution. Importantly, counties can issue securities such as bonds. Okay. It appears that we are determined that the counties must go the same route as the national government. One. Two, it looks like we are set to privatize our counties. <laughs> that's, what, that's what it sounds like. Money that has been given, if you were to just take a casual look at the Auditor General's report on, on very many of our counties, mm. what you will find is that there's a gross mismanagement of the funds mm. that they are given. Mm. Prior to this, they had not been given the green light to be able to borrow on their own. Yeah. There was a check and balance that was given to them. I'm sure the check and balance will still be there when it comes to the spending. But this is them coming to an agreement. I'm sure there are mechanisms where the national government will also come in to see everything is followed. Yeah. But what you've actually done is you're giving them an opportunity to have more money. Yes. Many of our counties have not shown that they have the presence of mind to utilize what they have been given. Mm -hmm. To benefit the people as they claim that they want to. Mm -hmm. So you are now allowing them to have more money. Yes. Good. It's allowed in the constitution. It's part of the law. Now the issue here is, uh, uh, you, the national treasury, are you able to give us the money on time? No. So you should just let us borrow them so that we can run our projects. And then when you give us okay. money, we'll pay back. Where we borrow pay. Mm. Pay. Where we borrow from. Pay. Okay. Now, what is the you are talking do? about. We are at a point where you the are national talking treasury about, is at a corner. Eric, you are talking about institutions mm. that have pending bills that, even if you just mentioned in passing, you would get embarrassed. Mm. They don't pay. Yes. You think this is going to be different? They pay commercial loans. When they keep taking those those overdrafts to pay salaries because money has you know, been delayed from the national that treasury. money that they get goes to a bank account. Mm. So there's no problem there. Police watch. And yes, and it is not them uh, who send the money to themselves. Mm. The National Treasury sends it to that. And the National Treasury knows that they borrowed that money. That one, no problem. This one, which they are borrowing on their own. Let me wait and see. Mm. Yes. But I can predict chaos. No, we should be allowed to borrow. I'm not saying they shouldn't be allowed to borrow. Everybody should borrow. National government has extended its ceiling. Now it wants to extend the ceiling again. And yet, counties have never been allowed to borrow. This is their time. You know, <laughs> the cost of passing this BBI is steep. Mm. And you can see it. But why is this thing coming now? Yes. Why is it coming now? Why, as we asked the other day, why are, uh, are MCS. Uh, MCS suddenly getting taxable loans? <laughs> 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 Grants now. <laughs> A grant by its nature should actually not be taxed. But <laughs> why? I mean, I have said that they should just pay the tax. But in all honesty, <laughs> it's a grant. A grant should come as it is. Mm. That's what I do. Otherwise, it's not a grant. Ten minutes to seven. Let's take another break and then we'll look at more headlines. Good morning. Spice FM. Hey, hey, it's getting hot in here. The media has greatly contributed to the moral rot that we experience in this country. I remember a senior politician telling me, point blank, nobody steals in the field. It's stolen in the granary. So my friend, if you're going to win an election, Ipange for granary. I think we are suffering from Stockholm Syndrome. Our violator and abuser <laughs> is also our redeemer in our mind. The whole political class, the whole political institution is rotten. It is based on ideals that cannot progress our country forward. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day.
Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice right. FM, Nairobi. So there's a story on page 8 of uh, the standard this morning and um, it's a sad story if you just look at it from just that express angle. A Nyeri court will make a ruling on Friday on whether a businessman and four others who were arrested in connection with the killing of his son a month ago will be released on bond. So the story here is of a, a young man, 33-year-old Daniel Mwangi, who was killed on the 1st of January 2021 after celebrating New Year's Eve with friends at a local pub in Mwaiga town, Nyeri. The man ended up dying. Police have started investigations, and what they are saying is that preliminary investigations are showing that um, there's a gentleman called Stephen Kenini. Stephen Kenini is this young man's father, biological father. Apparently, it's alleged that Mr. Kenini had uh, talked to his driver, who's also his personal assistant, and there was some money that had been paid out to go and get this young man killed. So several people were arrested by police. Uh, they have handed in their mobile phones. Police are investigating this case. The man and the other accused are in police custody. Let me understand this. Mm. The biological father of this young person yes. is behind or allegedly paid people to have his son killed. Yes. Isn't that really genuinely bizarre? It is completely bizarre. Why? He gave his PA and driver some money and told him, go get some people. Off that boy. Boy was offed. But why? According to the police. How old is the boy? 17? 33. 33. Why? You can't get it. You just, you don't, I, I, that's why I said, it's sad and bizarre. You know, whenever we think of these deaths, huh, mm. there's a group of people whom I find we don't discuss adequately. Right. The people who commit these crimes. Mm -hmm. What sort of people are these? What is it that gets an individual to the point where, we, okay, you can use technical terms, call mm. them sociopaths, call them psychopaths, call them whatever. Mm. But what is it that, because these numbers seem to be on the increase, or is it the reporting of it that seems to be on the increase? What is it that gets another human being to the point where they think that the best way of earning a living is by killing others? Is it by, I don't think, it's not even earning a living, it's solving a problem. No, yeah. it's but earning a living. Anyway, it's earning a living. Uh, no, so you're talking about the hired killers? Yes, that's the one I'm talking about. Specifically the hired killers. Yes, mm. because they're known. The assassins. For, for you to be summoned, mm. it is known that you're the sort of person who does such things. Yes. Yes. People know uh, you have that problem. Look uh, for someone. We know somebody who knows how to solve this problem. Yes. It's something you've done before. You have a reputation for it. And they actually do it, you know, just casually. And they'll even go and tell the police, yeah, you know that other one, it's so-and-so who did it, not me. Yes. Yes. It's a job description. Yeah. Yes. Well, it's obviously somebody who's gone through, it's somebody who's gone through a certain level of, de I would say, conditioning to the total loss of conscience. Mm. Um, and it's such people then that are sought out. Or such Is it progressive or? I don't think you lose conscience instantly. Or is it that they You lose that. Are sociopaths born that way? They, they would say that you're born, they would say that yes. there are certain things that you have inherently mm. that would cause you to lean in that particular direction. Mm. But then over time, as you start, as you live with these traits, as you start practicing, as you, you become, pra you hone your skill. You condition, yeah, basically, unfortunately, <laughs> you hone your skill. My goodness. But yeah. they've d done studies on the, m on the mind of a sociopath and been able to do traces back to when they were young and they would be able to trace that there were certain ways or mannerisms that they would have certain ways in which they would behave, that they would trace that back to when they were very young. Mm. And they could actually see that they behaved in a certain way. So there's certain traits I think you do come along with. So it's also possible for a sociopath to actually be engineered in the right way? It's yes. possible to unlearn this behavior, absolutely. There are people who are generally known to act without thinking. Mm. They'll be meaning things that other people would pause, they don't pause. Mm. Now, psychopaths are different. They are deliberate. They plan the things they want to do. They, 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 there's nothing like they acted on impulse. No, no, no. They know exactly what they want to do. 
Some get sexual pleasure from it. Some get supposed psychological pleasure from it. Some get what they may refer to some religious, whatever their logic. But there's a thinking behind their actions, mm. and they firmly believe that this right and wrong that you have that doesn't really feature mm -mm. In, in in the way they look at things. Mm -mm. No, it doesn't. It's something that they need to do, and they do it. Yeah, they do it. Yes. What needs to get done must get done. That report that Dr. Njenga and his colleagues wrote. Yeah. Is it going to join the queue of all these reports we keep talking ah, about? Yeah, of course. It's already it in the queue. That. Yeah. It did that a while ago. It did that. Mm -hmm. That is it. That's, that's how it happened. So, what's in the business daily? Not good news. Mm. Right. Business daily... What Tanzanians' COVID vaccine reluctance means to its neighbors. Okay. Right? Very simply, the biggest danger to the region and the globe is twofold. It's not just... Okay, one, as long as there are COVID-19 cases in Tanzania, it is impossible for neighboring countries which share its porous borders to be COVID-free. Two, Perhaps most importantly is the risk of new variants developing in the country where no one is keeping track. New variants emerge because of, of uncontrolled spread. If down the line a new variant emerges in Tanzania, the danger is that it would spread across the region and invalidate vaccinations that may have taken place if they're not effective against that particular variant. Mm. So essentially, what we're saying is the problem in Tanzania will be the problem of the neighbors. Mm -hmm. In short. If it's an extreme problem, the neighbors will also have an extreme problem. Mm -hmm. Yes. So then it's upon the neighbors to take action as well. It is actually incumbent upon the nation. If you look at the report that I was reading earlier on that have been published by Kemri mm. and uh, Welcome Trust, truck drivers are the ones who cross the borders more than perhaps anybody else. Mm. In the days of tourism, you'd say to operators. Mm. If already it is recorded, 42.3 or thereabout percent of those tested, there were 830 truck drivers and turn boys uh, tested, tested positive. Those that came from Tanzania. Yes, and crossing back and forth, back mm. and forth. Mm. And not just Tanzania. No, it's Tanzania, Uganda border even. Right. So the truth of the matter is, if you're seeing those numbers there, now, what do you think would happen if you tested, say, a, a larger population yeah. of truck drivers? Mm. In the fight against HIV, truck drivers were known to be also super spreaders in the same way. Mm. So this is not something new that we're talking about. All right. Time for us to look at traffic again. It's coming up to 7 o'clock. Keep you right here. In the next hour, we'll be speaking about locusts and what the government has been doing to address the locust invasion in the country. Good morning. It's 7 o'clock. up your life spice fm nakuru okay so it's building up a bit traffic. Today. It's time to get into the CBD. we have some piled up traffic on kiambu road and then joining with Higher square it's going to take some time to get out of this one all right langata road what's up uh <sighs> not much, actually. It's flowing not too badly right now. It's very, very foggy on Mombasa Road, and this is past um, the interchange, right, uh, going towards Kitengela out then from Athi River. So you want to be careful about that. Fog very, very low this morning. Uh, let's look at uh, the Likoni Channel today in Mombasa, stepping out for ferry serving you guys. Remember, you can only pay via M-Pesa. So anybody who's going there with cash you may not be able to make it this morning. So please think about that as you head there. But it seems to be flowing smoothly there. Coming back into Nairobi, however, Limuru Road is moving slowly into the CBD. We'll take a look at all of this and how it unfolds in a short while. It is traffic hour. Let's see how we can make it move this Tuesday. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, 
controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latif. Agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Two and a half minutes after seven o'clock, a very good morning to you wherever you are tuned in. If you're in Malindi, 97.7, or Nyeri, 90.9, or Eldoret, 96.7, Nakuru, 96.0, Kisumu, 102.5, Mombasa, 87.9, or 94.4 in Nairobi. Good morning. We're also now live on KTN Home for the next two hours from 7 up to 9. And we're live online, Spice FM KE, on YouTube, on Facebook, and on Twitter. Let's begin this hour with the day's proverb, CT Muga. If you carry the egg basket, do not dance. If you carry the egg basket, do not dance. Mm -hmm. Okay. Application of that, though. <laughs> Eggs are precarious. Uh -huh. Soft shells break easily. Mm -hmm. The rest requires simple arithmetic. Add one plus one and see what you come up with. Mm. One plus one is equals? Usually, mm. it's two. Okay. <laughs> Usually. Mm. That's the normal Z, two. Mm. So how would you apply this? I'm trying to think about, okay, so what are you telling someone? If you're carrying a secret, if you're... It's what? not really the eggs. It's, it's the eggs egg? and you. I start with the eggs, but mm. you, the carrier of the egg, surely you know you're carrying eggs, mm. okay? It doesn't have to be physical. If your situation is such that it's precarious, mm. if you're seeking, for instance, political office, you know I will always give a political example, mm. and you want people to vote for you, are you generally going to stand up, for instance, and tell the people, you know something? Part of the reason why I'm standing for elections is because I know you're gullible. Mm. I will tell you things that I will not do, and you will still elect me. So let me start with the things that I'm going to tell you, but I will certainly not do. Do you say that? Mm -hmm. No. So what do you say? You have suffered for the longest time because you've had people who say things which they never do. Yes. I am different. Let me explain to you why I'm different. Mm. Okay. You see those two poles that are were recently erected as you enter the cattle dip? Mm. I'm the one who donated those. Yes. <laughs> because I recognize the need. Yes. Do you see that uh, parking space that we've created for the border borders? Okay. Mm. Three of those iron sheets, I donated those. Mm. Okay. Because, and that's just the beginning. Our youth, our youth was suffering. Yes. And I knew that I must do something. Right. So, when you carry an egg basket, thou the, shall not dance. The government carries an egg, an egg basket all the time. The, 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 the government has egg baskets of health workers. The government mm -hmm. has health baskets of governors. The government has health baskets of security. Mm. It always has an egg basket. At any given point in time. Mm. And this is marvelous because the government, the government actually ends up doing a juggling act with eggs, not even just the basket. Sometimes we use the egg baskets. Look at our borrowing. Our borrowing shows us that we've been dancing with egg baskets. <laughs> and, uh, he, and here we are. And here we are. And now the counties want to dance with egg baskets. Mm. Yes. Oh, it's because of the national government dancing with the egg basket that now the counties have no option but pick their own baskets. Precisely. But the tune that they're dancing to yeah. is something very different. Mm. It's called the BBI. Ah, yes. Okay. So the matter of locusts um, and their invasion in the country. Ndu, just remind us again. When was the first time that the warning signs were given? You know, from this point where it was noticed that uh, in the Middle East something was happening well, to the so resident locusts. 
It looks like just yesterday, but the first time that we received this was around the time that the landslide happened in, just after the landslide happened in Pocot County in 2019, West Pocot, 2019 November is when we started, we got this first indication. So remember we talked about this when um, the landslides happened and then we said, look, as if though, as though that is not enough, then we've heard news that um, there is a weather shift or weather pattern shift coming out of Yemen that was then coming through to Somalia and then parts of Sudan and then coming into the country. And because of that, the locusts then had left that breeding area and were coming down towards Kenya. So 28, 2019 and November, December is now when there was warning, especially from the FAO um, and other bodies that look out for this. It's possible that they would come. And lo, lo and behold, they did come. Mm. And they made their debut in the country in 2019. Mm. Uh, and then followed up with that and continued breeding for about a year now is what we're, we've been looking at, uh, uh, just over a year. And even when the first breeds, the first breeds and the first swarms came and did their damage and there was that little reprieve for some time, then there was a warning, a secondary warning that, look, by June, um, we we're going to see more. And the June we're talking about now is by June 2021 mm -hmm. that we would see more but that has happened earlier and those that have come into the northern part of the country um have bred and uh, uh continued to breed and we still see more swarms coming in so this has been about for 18 months now has been the case <coughs> and it's not letting up and just because it does it's not carried um as often as we would like it to we tend to forget that this is actually happening but it's still going on there are farmers who have made astronomical i mean who have incurred astro astronomical losses um vegetation has been wiped out completely and people continue to deal with this menace uh, in certain parts of the country the northern the eastern parts of the country are the ones that are um, dealing with this more so than anybody else mm. so it's been here for some time the warnings have been there that they're likely to come back and exactly as the warnings have uh, played out is what we are seeing today so the government has uh, you know been doing a lot of work on this and we spoke to people who have participated in this who have been very very uh, part of the organ of of the operations especially at FAO we spoke to somebody the person who's coordinating this particular mission uh, at the FAO mm. and working with the Ministry of Agriculture and what they've been doing um, they explained to us especially when you know there was a whole issue of why are they saying that they don't have anything to spray with and they explained the whole logistical nightmare of actually getting the, the the sprays into the country getting the the, the aircraft right the, the the right kind mm. the the aircraft dusters that can then also be used in this particular mission and he was reporting that well progress had actually been made a lot of progress had been made in the country problem that we have as well is because somalia is not doing the kind of thing that we are doing and these locusts are coming through somalia so if the government of somalia is not really able to deal with the locust population in the country as we are able to do, then that also impacts on us. However, one of our journalists, the KTN journalist, Philip Keitani, who brings you the AgriTalk every weekday morning, 4 to 5 p.m. on KTN's Farmers TV, went around the country with a delegation of those who are actually dealing with the locusts, and he now joins us on the line. Philip, good morning. Good morning to you. Uh, How are you doing? Not bad, not bad. And thank you for host for also having me in this conversation. Karibu Sana, welcome to the Situation Room. Thank you. So you did a tour around the country. Some yes, parts. We did now. a tour. We we did a tour last week yes. um, with FAO and, uh, and and the government spokesman mm -hmm. in parts of Isiolo and uh, parts of Meru. And we, at the moment, we, they they have what they call the second wave of the locusts yep. that came in also early, uh, late December. In fact, they were saying on Chris, a day before Christmas. Mm -hmm. So uh, the first wave, they, de they dealt with it, though they fumbled a lot uh, during that first wave before, because they were not prepared. Yep. But this second time, they, uh, they were ready for it. And uh, as we were going around, we could see a lot of swamps. They were, it, they were big swamps. Mm. And we visited up some parts of um, Isiolo, but the most part that I saw problems was in parts of Meru because of uh, its population. Mm. It is densely populated. Mm. They could not use um, air spray to, to deal with the locusts. Yeah. So they had to use hand pumps. 
and use uh, vehicles to to try and kill the uh, to, to to kill the locals. Philip, when you say they could also, not, when you say they could not use air sprays to kill the locals, yeah. what, what 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 are we saying here? Could not, were unable to, or because they were too many, or didn't have the right uh, equipment? What was the problem? No, 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 no. The, the equipment was there. Mm. The issue was the population on the ground. The population on the ground. Human is, population. Human population. We're talking yes, about human population on the ground was okay. huge, so they could not use uh, air spray because mm. they had to be very specific on what they are spraying. Mm. Philip, experts, so that, experts tell us that uh, when we talk, talk about swarms, to the, they don't just measure numbers because you can talk about the millions, but you measure the area which they are covering. So when you yes. say that there were swarms, give us an indication of how large this area, uh, the, the, well, the area that had been overwhelmed by these swarms, as we call them. Oh, well, that one was, uh, trying to even describe it, it was, it was just mind-boggling. <laughs> The, okay, boggle our minds as well, please. <laughs> <laughs> the swarms were so many. I've never seen anything like that in my life. Covering what sort of area? And, uh, at, the, at, the, at the time, um, there was a region, it's, it's our own location called uh, Kangeta. Mm. And it's, it's like the entire location was covered by the locusts. How big is the location? I, uh, I can't tell uh, how big Just roughly was, speaking, which, of course. Um, I think it's bigger than the city of Nairobi. <laughs> okay, wow. that's a that's, uh, that's a good analogy. <laughs> so uh, the, when you talk about the CBD, the entire CBD is covered by locusts. Okay. So and then uh, what what they do? They start this thing very early in the morning before before the sun come up the, before the sun comes up because um, when they get warm, that is the time they start flying away. Uh-huh. So they need to start spraying them um, as early as 6 a.m. Uh, as early as 6 a.m. when they are still dormant. So we were there very early in the morning. So in the morning we could not. We were wondering where these things, these people are spraying because we could walk around and you could see one, two. But when it it got to around nine, ten, and they started um, flying, it was a, a whole cloud. Wow. It was crazy. But uh, they assured us it was one of the of of of, of the swarms that they they've been following for a while, mm. and they've they've been dealing with it slowly. And they were, they've also been trying to guide it out of that um, densely populated area. Mm. Towards uh, they were trying to uh, they were hoping the wind will help them push it towards uh, the 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 sparsely populated areas of Isiolo where they can now deal with it properly with the with with the air spray. Mm. Uh, Philip, yeah. I wanted to explain something to me. You mentioned the word preparedness. Huh? Uh-huh. What does preparedness look like? Previously, they were not prepared. Now, they were mm-hmm. prepared. So, in terms of preparedness, what did they have in place? Well, this time around, they showed us amazing stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, they had stores full of uh, chemicals, hand sprays, everything you collect, PPEs for protective gear for the, for the guys doing it. They also had a number of uh, boat choppers and uh, fixed wing uh, uh, aeroplanes that they could use to 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 to, to spray them. Mm-hmm. And then again, they were using this time around. They are using satellites to track. They were using now tech. They've integrated the technology into this, whereby they can now use satellite to track both the locusts within the country and the locusts within our neighbors. That is some. Uh, they were. They were. They were. For, they were mostly focusing on those in Somalia and uh, parts of uh, Ethiopia. And you could see it live on, on some screen that they, they, they had uh, somewhere at Lewa. Okay. Yeah. So when, let's talk about the, what you witnessed, that uh, early in the morning, as early as 6 a.m., people with hand sprays would get up and go spraying. Around how many people are being deployed on such a mission? Well, the... the um, that morning, I saw more than uh, 30 young men from uh, NYS. And then they were also joined by a team from um, um, the Kenya Armed Forces. Mm-hmm. So it is a whole battalion out there. Um, depending on the size of, 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 of the area they are covering, it, it, they also, uh, that's when they decide how many people to deploy on this particular day. And also, on, um, depending on the number of swarms that are, uh, if they are, many swarms in different places 
so they have also to, to devise these to divide these resources so that they can be able to tackle all those swarms at the, uh, at the same time and the locals involved yes the locals uh, they, they involve the chiefs so the chiefs need, now need to uh, uh, break down the information and, and take it to the people as early as possible but still there were they were they were um, um, a little bit of um, complaints here and there because some were saying the locals arrived uh, last evening and we woke up this morning, we met uh, this huge delegation from government that are there to deal with it. So they didn't have enough time to prepare, but the government said, uh, promised that they had done their work, they had uh, uh, already informed them in advance because after the spray, you don't have, you don't, you, you cannot pick anything from your farm for three days. Right. Um, even so, there were some were wondering what do we do with, uh, because we can get uh, the grow mirror. Mm. Some lady was telling me uh, I was to harvest my mirror the next day, so right. that is a loss for her. But it was a necessary uh, inconvenience for their for their own good. Which was a greater con- inconvenience, in your opinion? The uh, locusts. I'm taking the view that locusts also chew mirror. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly, from your yes, laughter, uh, my, my assumption is misplaced. <laughs> no, 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 no. That was true. Uh, in fact, the, the locals were saying, um, yes. In fact, they were using all manner of stuff to try and chase the, the, the locals from their farms. They were beating drums. They were beating um, iron sheets to, to try and kick them out of their farms so that they don't destroy, uh, because they had a little bit of maize and the mirror. So uh, they were complaining it was chewing their mirror as well. And it could um, going to affect what was going to go to the market after that. Yeah. But, uh, but so which it, is uh, uh, so the, the, thank you very much for for, for 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 at least edifying me on that. But now tell me, so which is the greater danger, leaving the locusts or driving them away? Because I, I think if the locusts weren't driven away, they may have been nothing to take to the market. That is true. That's why I said uh, it was a necessary evil that. Um, uh, or a, a necessary inconvenience when when the government came and sprayed and told them you cannot uh, pick anything from your farm for the next three days yep. so that they can give time to the chemicals to break down as well. Hmm. We're having a conversation with Philip Keitani. He is a journalist with the Standard Group. He hosts a show every weekday, 4 to 5 p.m., KTN Farmers TV, AgriTalk, and we're having the conversation AgriTalk in the Situation Room. He went round Isiolo and Meru recently to look at what the government is doing to deal with a locust invasion, accompanied by the FAO and the government spokesman. And the government spokesman now joins us in the studio, retired Colonel Cyrus Aguna. Asante sana for joining us. How are you? Karibu sana, and it's good to have you, good to see you in the studio this morning. You're just hearing from uh, what Philip is telling us, the experience that he had on the ground. Um, going to these parts of Isiolo, of Meru, huge swarms of locusts, um, government doing, playing its part, locals as well, you know, playing their part in trying to understand what's happening. Uh, from what he's saying, there was a, there's, there's that issue of locusts are coming, the locals need to be involved in some way yeah. so that they know this is what we're going to do this is what it entails we are coming up with we are coming to hand spray we cannot use aerial spray because it's going to affect you this and the other so how is that being coordinated uh, thank you very much uh, for that question indeed when locusts are, are sighted you know um citing the locusts or locusts is perhaps one of the most important or critical aspect of containment mm. because when you can't see them then you can't attack them mm. Mm. yes so uh, this sighting is done you know uh, through a number of uh, method methods one it can be cited by local scouts that have been trained and then they relay the information using uh, uh, the app that uh, Kaitan was talking about mm. so they relay that information to a joint a command center who will be able to now to coordinate that information from other other you know, basis as well. So once that information is received, then it is collected and analyzed, and the decision is made whether it's going to be um, an air spray or a ground spray. Mm-hmm. Now that determination is made based on a host of factors. One of the factors of consideration is that uh, is their settlement around there, are there are water bodies around there, are there animals around there. So once that has been analyzed, then they'll come to the conclusion that this requires 
ground spray or mm -hmm. this requires aerial spray, of course, depending on the, you know, the, the surrounding area. But once that decision is made, it cannot be done without the, the local DCC, that mm -hmm. is Deputy County Commissioner, mm -hmm. as well as the local sub-chief. Mm -hmm. So it is not like we have seen locals today and tomorrow we are out spraying. Mm -hmm. There has to be a procedure that is followed to ensure that the local people are sensitized about how they should behave during the period of, uh, uh, of spray. Mm. Yes. Are these girls then supposed to go to the people like door to door or call a baraza? They, they don't go to door to door because that would take for a very long time. They, right. But they call barazas. And indeed, you know, barazas, when you call, not everybody will turn up. Mm. But critical mass will be informed about what they need to do, how they need to behave during the time that uh, the spraying is taking place and what they need to do after, in fact, what they need to do before the spray, mm. what they need to do during the spray and what they need, they need to do after the spray. Mm. Yes. I think livelihoods is one of the things that people are looking at here. Like even with the spraying, then these are people who then depend on, you know, uh, their products to go to market and having to then, de obviously it's a menace for everybody, but having to deal with that and say, okay, you can't harvest, you can't take to market tomorrow. Um, so now in terms of moving for moving ahead, uh, are we looking at a situation that's going to be here for some time? It, and it, if so, how really in terms of a long term solution, what are we looking at? Now looking at, of course, even as I was coming, I was listening to what uh, Kaitani was saying. Mm. And indeed, it did indicate that, uh, you know, we are dealing with the second phase of the locust. Mm. And the first phase was perhaps much more destructive because right. then we're, we're ill prepared mm. for a number of reasons. This second phase has been met better, better managed. And if you look at when we first, you know, able to cite this second phase sometime in November last year until now, a lot of neutralization has been carried out. Most of the swarms that have been able to cross in or even that, that have been identified have been neutralized. Indeed, uh, you know, cumulatively, 303 swarms have been cited mm. and over 80 to 80% 80 of those swarms have been neutralized. Mm -hmm. That's a huge number. Mm -hmm. And therefore, whatever is left, yes, they may still be destructive in some way, but not as destructive as perhaps the picture may want to be painted. Mm. I, I, I really love that language, neutralized. Now, <laughs> what do we do with the locusts that we've neutralized? Well, there are two ways. One, they are just left to die mm -hmm. on the ground. Mm -hmm. But then there is also an NGO that is now, um, you know, trying to trap locusts and then be able to um, process them to become animal feeds. Right? Mm -hmm. However, mm -hmm. Uh, when they die on the ground, people are also sensitized not to be able to use them for food. Mm. Because indeed, some of them may still be having the pesticides on them. Mm -hmm. So that sensitization is actually being carried out by the government mm -hmm. using the Ngao structure on the ground. Yeah. Having a conversation with government spokesman Colonel Cyrus Aguna and Philip Keitani of KTN Farmers TV, we are talking about the invasion of locusts in the country and what the government is now doing. We have a second wave that, uh, as Philip has told us, arrived round about the 24th of December into the country. So swarms being spotted some parts of the country and the government is on the ground using NYS, using some military officers, using fixed plane and helicopters and uh, all this being coordinated, according to Philip, very well. And he says he's been impressed. Now we're looking at the impact of that, what uh, that is doing, especially in terms of eradicating the swarms and also what it's doing to the communities, what it's done to the communities that have been affected so far. We are live on KTN Home, we are live on Spice FM, and we are live online. Let's take a break. We will be back shortly and continue this conversation. Good morning. This is The Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Spice up your life. La 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 Japan Biotechnology Yes Hey Samuel Are you into business now? What are you importing from Japan? Knowledge I'm going to study biotechnology In the best university in Japan I applied And ta-da Hmm, Japan? Yes. You will have to first learn Japanese. No, my friend. They have more than 850 courses that are provided in English and very affordable. Hey, aye, aye, aye. How do I apply? <laughs> Kuja Osome Japan. Study in Japan Global Network Project brings you an opportunity to study in Japan. Log on to www.studyinjapan-africa.com and apply to study in Japan with over 100 universities providing cutting-edge science and technology courses including the field of robotics 
robotics, artificial intelligence, AI, environmental studies, information technology, and many more. Not only postgraduate, but undergraduate level is also covered. Mention our course, you will not fail to get it. Visit our website today on www.studyinjapan-africa.com. All right, so today we're looking the at weather the with conditions, spi- at least for some parts. The sun will come through in Nairobi at going to highs of 25, down to lows of 16 today. Mostly cloudy conditions in Nyeri at 12, highs of 23. The highs will be 24 in Nakuru, mostly cloudy at 15. It's 13 degrees and mostly cloudy in Eldoret, highs of 22 today. 20 in Kisumu, highs of 29. Kakamega at 17 is cloudy with highs of 28 today. We're looking at highs of 32 in Mombasa, where it's partly sunny right now at 26. It's also partly sunny in Malindi at 26, going to highs of 31. And Kampala at 20 is partly sunny, highs of 27 and lows of 19 today. Cloudy conditions in Dar es Salaam at 25, highs of 29. Johannesburg will be cloudy for most parts of today at 16, going to highs of 23. 34, the high in Lagos, where it's still hazy at 26. Cloudy conditions in Kinshasa at 23, going to highs of 31. Spice up your life. It's a parking lot because the highway today. Traffic. And things are not moving. Um, at the Pangani interchange, vehicles on the main highway are being stopped for some time to give priority to cars joining from Kiambu Road. So that is taking some time. Kiambu Road, because of the heavy traffic that we see there, priority is being given to uh, Kiambu Road today. So if you're waiting, that's what's going on. All right. And I know it's a bit uncomfortable, but it's going to take some time to get out of this one. Langata Road building up quite. Uh, some coming towards the Timor roundabout. Go towards Bagadi Way. It will not be too bad. Go towards Nanyo Stadium, however. It's going to slow down for some time as you get into the CBD, then out towards Westlands. So some traffic this Tuesday morning. Not crying just yet, but we'll have a look at what it looks like shortly. Spice FMKE. That's how you can reach us on Twitter. Text 40127. Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. FM, KTN Home and Online. Having a conversation about the government's uh, dealing with locust invasion in the country. The government is on the ground. We're having the government spokesman, Colonel Cyrus Aguna, in the studio. And on the line is Philip Caetani of KTN, KTN Farmers TV. He brings AgriTalk every week demo, every weekday afternoon, <laughs> 4 to 5 p.m. on KTN Farmers TV. So Philip was on the ground with a team that also included the government spokesman, Colonel Cyrus Aguna, and the team from Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations. Mm. Right. So, I mean, I guess the question for both of you, and um, we start with you, uh, Colonel, is that, so are we looking at a situation whereby at one point, hopefully sometime in the, in the near future, we will say this uh, um, uh, locust menace is done and we have put in place mechanisms for early warning so we know what to do? Uh, can we be at a place whereby um, early warning systems are put in place so that we know what to do in the future? Certainly, yes. But like, like we did mention earlier, when you look at what happened during phase one, it's totally different from what happened during this phase two. Mm. Phase one, like we did mention, and like you rightfully said, the first sighting of locusts was in uh, December 29, 28th mm. of 2019. And it took a bit of time before we could be able to put you know, infrastructure on the ground and also position logistics. So during that period of time, of course, locusts were they kept on moving in and mm-hmm. you know spreading around the country. Now this second phase, now the lessons from the first phase have been brought to bear in this second phase, and therefore this second phase has been better managed as soon as they cross from neighboring country, you know, one of the neighboring or two of or both of them, that they are able to be sighted and surveillance now initiated to be able to follow them every place they go until they are neutralized. So yes, we're in a much better place now than we were during phase one. Now coming to the right into your question, is that uh, yes, we have put mechanisms in place 
to ensure that uh, there is no any one time now that locals will cross into the country without any surveillance whatsoever. We have an aircraft that is, you know, deployed to keep on surveilling the border, you know, uh, with the north northern, you know, country in the north and the country in the east. But we also have got, you know, scouts on the ground. In total, there are about 1,670 scouts that are deployed in all the counties that are affected by locals. These scouts, you know, uh, they may be distributed differently depending on the threat of locals in every county. And therefore, their role really is to ensure that any time locals cross in, that there is an alarm being raised, and then the locals can be tracked until they are able to roost or perch somewhere, then they can be attacked. So in terms of surveillance, in terms of monitoring, we're in a much, much better place than we are today. With regard to whether we can say that we'll never have locusts again in this country, that may not be necessarily realistic. Mm. Why? Because they're not necessarily coming from our country. Right. They're moving in from uh, you know, other countries. From elsewhere. From elsewhere. So perhaps what you can say that uh, will we be able to have mechanism that would be able to li limit or reduce the impact on the ground when they part? Yes. That I can assure you. Talk of mechanisms, uh, Colonel. Is it possible for us to... Uh, have a joint task force with our neighbors to ensure that uh, we understand what they need to do because we know very clearly where they come from. Eh? Is that possible? I ask this because I know that we've had some minor disagreements with one of our neighbors. Uh, but is it possible? That's yeah, what it I'm is asking. possible because right now even what EGAD is doing, remember, this is uh, a situation that is cross-border, mm. that you cannot be able on your own to handle it without you know, similar activity in, in a neighboring country. And if, if that were not to happen, then whatever you're doing in your country may be successful, but may not be efficient, mm -hmm. right? So yes, IGAD being the structure uh, at that level has brought in all the stakeholders uh, from every country within the region to be able to come up with a mechanism that now can be used to deal with the locust. And that is why we're even saying right now that FAO, uh, Somalia, FAO, Ethiopia, has put in place mechanisms that would help in terms of combating you know, the locust. Mm -hmm. Indeed, in Somalia, there could be issues that we all understand. Uh, and therefore, the mechanisms and even the intervention in that country may not as effective as our country here and, and uh, you know, uh, the other country up, up north. Mm. But certainly FAO and, and IGAD is working together to ensure that there is a regional uh, mechanism to deal with the locust. Philip, um, just from what we've been able to see before, and now we're, we're in some wet weather around the country, and uh, we've seen previously with these swarms that you have a little bit of new vegetation, and that encourages these swarms to, you know, get... Uh, um, excited again about eating up that little vegetation. With the rain, farmers are also encouraged to plant. So what are we looking at here in this uh, current situation? Planting vis-a-vis -vis waiting while these swarms are being taken care of. How are these uh, being able to go forward? Um, from what I got from the ground, uh, the government is encouraging the population or the, encouraging the country to, to go on with their lives. You should not stop because the locusts are here. Um, because they also don't stay in one particular place at any given time. They keep moving. So they might come to your place or they may not come to your place. So if you decide not to plant and then eventually they don't come to your region, it will be your loss. Right. So uh, they're encouraging us to, uh, or the population out there to continue their lives as they also try and uh, um, handle the situation uh, in the best way they know. In some of these areas where there was uh, the invasion of the first phase, and of course, uh, because of very many other factors, then there were farmers who got seriously affected. What has the government done to help them recover? Yes, the government working together with other uh, development partners, FAO, World Bank, DLCO, have come up with a you know, kind of support to the farmers that have been affected. One of the support that's given to these farmers is to provide them with training in how they can be able to engage in uh, modern ways of farming. But secondly, they're also being provided with uh, subsidized seeds, you know, to be able to plant. So they have got subsidized seeds. Uh, they are also being given fertilizers uh, to be able to uh, support them when they are, they are, you know, planting. So the government certainly is on top of that, working together with FAO as mm -hmm. well as uh, World Bank and, and also DLCO. Are those areas also affected again by the second wave? 
some of the areas are affected, like, uh, you know, we went to Isiolo, like Kipi, as well as uh, Meru region. Mm. And yes, they were affected. Indeed, they would be affected. Reason being that, like you're saying, this is desert locust. Yep. Meaning that they should be found in areas that are a bit of asal regions, a bit dry, you know. So again, if should there be a third wave, the same areas will still be affected. They're likely to be affected. They're likely to be affected. Yes. As you spoke to the people on the ground, Philip, and, um, you know, especially those parts of, Air, of, of Isiolo, which had been affected the first time, and now there's a second wave. What are the people feeling? What's the feeling of the people on the ground? Are they are they feeling that you know they are now happy with the, what the government is doing? Are they still hung up with maybe what did not happen the first time? Uh, well, um, I, we visited a few farms, a few um, uh, families that live in Siolo, and they were happy with the, how the situation was being handled currently. But the first time they are saying they were really devastated. They they felt they were on their own the first time. But this time around, they are feeling the government has, has come out to help them. Um, they have not seen as much um, locusts that they had seen the first time. Uh, and they feel also they are being involved in the fight, uh, uh, in this fight of, of, of fighting the locusts. Mm. And Colonel Laguna has told us about some of those NGOs that are working at uh, you know creating animal feeds out of this i mean that's quite innovative did you have experience with any of those organizations philip no no i know i didn't uh, get an opportunity to meet them mm. um i'm still trying to wrap my head on how even they will start collecting the, the those <laughs> locals <laughs> how are they doing it Callum? they're doing it this way you know that at night they have light so when this you know press see light then they come to us and then they're trapped and then they fall in a drum all right mm -hmm. yes mm -hmm. you know so the only challenge like i did mention that even them they were able to tell us that you know you cannot tell locust that has been sprayed and yeah. one that has not been sprayed yeah. and that's why even as they prepare they process them they're not necessarily designed for human consumption as it is yeah. so it's mainly for animal consumption for animal feeds yes but but uh I would assume that maybe there's a number of days when the residue then falls off. So you can say if you've sprayed, then the residue yes, is on yeah, for yes. <clears throat> but a week, see, two, three. Yeah, indeed, that, and exactly what Ketan was saying, that mm. uh, you know, the, um, the, the pesticide that is used is supposed to oxidize within a period of 37, 72 hours. Mm. That is three days. Right? So within three days, then they're not supposed to be you know, uh, harmful mm. in whatever way. But again, you cannot tell when this locust was sprayed. Yeah. It you might have been sprayed yesterday. <laughs> so it has not necessarily gone through the 72 hour period, <laughs> right? So you still have to take some precaution. Right. Yes. Mm. Something that keeps uh, in my head with regards to this matter of locusts, mm. uh, do we know, uh, are there known patterns for these locust invasions? Yes, indeed, uh, from FAO and from the expert, yes, there are known patterns and they're, no, they're known corridors where they pass through, depending on the wind direction. Mm. So when there is wind blowing from, say, Middle East to Yemen, into Eritrea, Ethiopia, Somalia, then they follow that pattern of the wind. So there are areas that they will be known to actually to enter through the country. They will probably not come from the, the places like Lodwa, but they'll eventually get to Turkana mm. through that pattern through which the wind flows. You know, So that, that is something that we are, told, we, mm. we are being advised by the you know, the FAO, that weather is a, an important factor when it comes to dealing with, uh, with, with locusts. Is there any benefit we derive from these uh, invasions? I mean, the, 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 the negatives, we always talk about just how they eat mm. everything they come across. But those who study locusts, are there any benefits that... Uh, I would imagine so, because any new phenomenon that comes in, remember, the last time that uh, there was major locust invasion was 70 years ago. Mm. And therefore, people who study locust might have gone without any live example, you know, 70 years later. So now that we are seeing locust after 70 years, certainly those who are in that field are actually, you know, doing a lot of studies to find out the patterns, you know, uh, how they migrate, how, how, how they, they, you know, they multiply, mm. the, the kind of uh, routes they take. So, yes, there's a lot that can be learned from that academically. Which can then be, or scientifically, that can then be used in terms of, you know, our intervention. Mm. Yes. Do you think it'll get to a point whereby, I mean, 
look, I mean, I'm mean all for uh, the partnerships that we see happening between non-governmental in, um, organizations and government, intergovernmental and things like that. I mean, I think it's a, a definitely a way to go, especially for development. Do you think you can get to the point whereby uh, um, Kenya, a country like Kenya, takes the lead in some of these things to see that there's an, there are areas within the country whereby things like this are prone to happen uh, by virtue of the fact that uh, geography is a certain way. Do you think that Kenya could take the lead at some point and say, well, you know what, this is what we see. Um, anything that would come in would be support. Um, You're to asking at the regional level or at at the, con at, the, at the country level? At the country level, certainly, yes. Even when you have DLCO, we have got FAO, we have got all these other, mm. you know, agencies, they're still working under the direction of the government. Mm. The okay, government so the, takes... The government of Kenya is taking the is lead. Is taking the lead, okay. yes. Mm. So all these other NGOs are just coming in to, uh, you know, provide support. Okay. But the lead agency is the government, mm. yes. Mm. And then at the regional level, certainly it may not necessarily be an individual government because now there's a regional mechanism. And there are two mechanisms here talking about EGAD at the, you know, that level, mm. but also the ESE. Mm. You know, ESE in the sense that if it is affecting member states of the ESE, then again it is up to the ESE to come up with you know, various strategies on how these three or the six countries of the region can be able to deal with the low cost. Mm. Now beyond ESE, certainly EGAD comes in you know, to be able to you know, find you know, a mechanism that can be deployed to be able to deal with the locusts at the regional level. Mm. Yes, and beyond EGAD, certainly there are also other agencies. Because if you're talking about DLCO, DLCO is basically for East Africa, mm. but there are other DLCO for other regions of Africa as well. Yes. Mm. Mm. So with all these organizations and uh, you know, agencies mm. in place, what went wrong the first time? <laughs> You know, there's nothing really that went wrong. Certainly, this, like we did mention that, you know, for 70 years, mm. there was no infrastructure on the ground. Mm. You know, again, this is not something that you really uh, expect to happen every now and then. Yeah. So when they were sighted uh, for the first time, then now mobilization had to, uh, to start in terms of putting structures on the ground, in terms of coming up with various bases on the ground, in terms of mobilizing logistics to be positioned to be able to deal with you know, the locusts. Yeah. That took a bit of time. Mm. Right now we're talking about six bases mm. that, had been that have been established in the country. Those spaces were established in phase one. Yep. But now after the locusts in phase one were sort of contained and controlled, we did not necessarily deactivate these bases. Yeah. So when phase two did come in, then now we only sort of strengthened and reactivated the bases. So infrastructure was on the ground in phase two. Mm. Now, we cannot say the same for phase one. Mm. Yes. So as we are preparing, certain the locusts were still, they kept on coming, you know. But right now, this time around, they are coming and they are being contained and, and you know, uh, being um, surveilled and then targeted for neutralization. So yeah. you're basically saying that it was a steep curve. I mean, um, you're talking about people who have studied locusts but have not dealt with a locust invasion of this magnitude. And they are suddenly thrown into the deep end. Locusts are coming. We are seeing. They are the, here on the ground. You don't have pesticides. You don't have <laughs> aircraft. You don't have any ground surveillance team trained. Right. So you have to train them. Mm. And training teams takes a bit of time to train, to train a team to be able, because these people are not necessarily people who have studied locusts, mm. but you're training them so that they can be able to help you in the containment. Mm. Right? And of course, some of these locusts, you know, they go and roost in areas that are completely you know, hostile, yeah. hostile in terms of terrain. Yeah. So when you have locusts in such kind of environment that aircraft cannot go in there, no more you know, scout cannot go in there, then you have to look for another you know, uh, support. And this is when our KDF comes in to go and help out in spraying areas where many scouts may not want to venture in because of either insecurity based on the nature of terrain. Yeah. Yes. So from, from um, those lessons that have been taken, organizations such as FAO and DLCU must be putting, you know, uh, keeping their records for the sake of the other generation, 70 years from Certainly now. Yes. That Not just at FAO, <laughs> but even at the Ministry of uh, at Government at, level. At Government level. Yeah, their records being kept. So what, what kind of lessons are they, from, from, what you, from your interaction with, with, the, with these experts, what kind of lessons are they picking in terms of in future, if you see maybe you have started seeing swarms developing in that neighboring country in Yemen, it's going to take 
as approximately this long for them to arrive here. So this is you what know, you know, should start You know, locusts move at a pace of 130 or to 50 kilometers a day. Mm. So therefore, if they are seen in perhaps somewhere in Somalia or somewhere in Ethiopia, mm. you can be able to estimate how in what period yeah. of time mm. they'll be able to cross into, uh, into this country. And by that time, now based on the experience from the previous phases or you know, previous invasions, then you can begin to very quickly mobilize because now the infrastructure is on the ground. We, perhaps what we may not, depending on when the next wave will come, if mm -hmm. the next wave comes again 70 years from now, mm -hmm. then certainly you can be rest assured that we may not have the pesticide to just keep them for 70 years. Mm -hmm. So when they come, and we perhaps notice them maybe coming from Yemen, coming from other parts of Middle East, mm -hmm. then they begin to mobilize quickly, if, at all, if, at, if ever they'll cross into the country. So that when they cross, then we are ready for them. That did not happen during phase one. Phase two, yes, it did happen. Mm -hmm. yes. When we talk about... Um pesticides that we use. Um, from my reading, I came across something that the FAO has recommended, a fungus. Mm. That uh, the name is actually lengthy. Let me try and read it. Mm. Metahesium and it's soft layer. The, the, the fungus is supposed to, as opposed to this spraying, uh, it grows inside the uh, locust and then kills it eventually. Mm. Ha, have we applied some of these new fungal ideas that no. maybe FAO has, has come up with? I will not talk about FAO and yes. what they have, but what I know that we are using as a government mm. is a pesticide that is able to break very quickly. It's like a spray. Mm. And if even if you are lo if looking at an aircraft spraying, mm. very close to the aircraft, you may not even be able to see the fumes coming out because it is sprayed in a manner that as soon as it gets out of the cylinder, it begins to break down, mm -hmm. right? Right. So, um, you know, uh, that's why we're calling it that it atomizes very, very quickly, mm. you know, to the extent that, uh, you know, by the time it's getting onto uh, the surfaces of, of this locust, they may not kill them immediately. And that is by design, because you're also doing that so that uh, the, the amount mm. of, uh, you know, uh, poison mm. may not be harmful even to the local to the fauna, environment. And, yes. to the environment. Mm. So that they will probably die several hours, maybe hours later. So it is possible, therefore, that some people may see spraying taking place, but they don't see locusts dying immediately. So they're mm -hmm. concerned that they may be saying that uh, uh, nothing is magic too, nothing <laughs> is happening. But that is done by design. So that is the one that we're using, so right. that we are able also to conserve the environment, also protect the health of our people. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Philip, do you see that there are people in the area who would want to use um, locusts for food? Um, I did not come across any person who was talking about using it as food. Uh, but in our conversation with both um, some experts in the field, they were saying they can be consumed as food. But at the current state, because of the intervention the government is doing, they were not advising that uh, you consume the locust as food. Because as uh, Colonel Laguna has rightly put it, you don't know which locust has been sprayed or has, uh, which one has not been. So you may end up consuming a contaminated locust, uh, thinking you've got uh, some nice protein on your, on your plate. Mm. <laughs> but also in addition to that, if you allow me. Mm. Yes. You know, the aspect of food, food has got also cultural, right. you know, aspects yeah. to it. So there are certain cultures in this country that may probably find locust a delicacy. Which is where I was going with that, <laughs> because that's an option for, for some people. Yeah, but unfortunately, so the culture, people that culture, culture, that culture. That well, culture. No, not necessarily, but then yeah. what happens to those who may have, who, who look at it and then we're discouraging them from, from doing so, or even looking at it as a, as a, as yeah, a it's source? It's a health, yeah. health issue. Health hazard is a, is a has major one. Yes, yeah. it's a major one. Yeah. But indeed, again, mm. even areas where people have got the culture of uh, feeding on these locusts, unfortunately, they're not in those areas. Mm. Okay. You know, these are areas perhaps of Western Kenya. Mm. But now this, <laughs> these locusts, uh, you know, have invaded northeastern and eastern provinces, mm. whose culture may not necessarily, you know, um, you know, uh, 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 you know. Yeah, for, for them, for them, this no, is not. Their food. dietary culture doesn't include locusts. Into yes. lo locusts, or you understand? Or so such. even though yes, or a lot like has fish. been said about, you know, uh, 
the locusts being very rich in proteins, mm. but as a government we're still concerned about the health issue. Yeah. Right. Uh, and therefore I know that perhaps some cultures can rub on to others, so when they hear that people of one region can eat them, they may also want to try them out mm. in another region. Mm. But nonetheless, the government is very concerned about you know, the he health implications of this. Once you've spread a locust, indeed you, like we did say, that within three days, mm. you know, all the you know, pesticide, pesticide would have atomized, yes. and therefore it's no longer harmful. Mm. But then may not tell where, when it was spread, or where it was spread from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you're better, you know, off without necessarily, you know, uh, trapping them for for a meal. Mm -hmm. Why are these locusts called desert locusts? Because they thrive best in a in a desert environment. Yes. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you're saying they are mm -hmm. attracted to areas that are dry or semi-arid. Yes. Mm -hmm. But then they have to eat, and I'm certain that part of their uh, of the, the of their dietary considerations is not sand, okay? It's not sand, but even in this environment, they are actually green foliage. Yeah, but yeah. not that plenty. Not, not not that much. But you see, that's why you can't find them in Eldoret in large quantity because of mm. even Nyeri, even you know uh, parts of Mount Kenya because it is pretty cold there. It's climatic because conditions. It's, yes. So you know the way based on what we saw in Isiolo, is that when the weather is damp, they don't fly. They're waiting for the weather to get a bit dry so that the wings can be able to become touched. Because the wind, the, their wings the wind also, well. also, also, also get wet. Y yes, uh, yes, you understand. Mm -hmm. So in areas where perhaps the weather, you know, um, and, and the temperatures may be a bit low, they may not survive well in those such areas. That's why areas like, you know, this town, eastern province. So they simply, is, is it like, for instance, given that their life cycle isn't really that great? Three months. Yes. So they more or less find a place where they can eat, reproduce, and then wait and to then die. Wait to die, yes. Okay. And we're shortening that cycle. Mm -hmm. okay. Imagine. Because of the impact that those three months have on, on people's lives. Oh, it's devastating. You now, mm -hmm. we were asking Philip to explain to us and just paint for us a picture of the size of a swarm. And he told us, for example, this one he witnessed uh, in uh, Kangeta, which he says, if you just look at the entire of Nairobi CBD, that is one swarm. Paint for us a picture. I, yes, but the, the swarms that you are seeing mm. now mm. may not be that expansive mm. okay. <laughs> uh, compared to what we saw but during one. phase one. Okay. Philip was flabbergasted. By yeah, what what he saw. maybe it was Flabagas because Shanghai. he didn't see, yeah, he didn't swamp see phase, phase one. one. In yeah. fact, he's still yeah. recovering even as we speak. Yeah, he was shocked. Yes. I, of course, I was with him. <laughs> <Aulishanga> shocked, but, <laughs> but you see, what we saw in phase one, <laughs> yes. if swarms, swarms are passing over this building, mm. it will be a Dark. total shadow to darkness here. <laughs> what? Yes. That is what we're dealing with during phase one. Phase one, sorry, phase two, a locust sort of, when they cross, uh, which we have also seen that they are also breaking into smaller, smaller, smaller swarms. Mm. You may find one big swarm crossing into the country from a neighboring country, and then it splits into smaller, smaller swarms. And that's why even when you're talking about 306 that have been cited, there may not be 306 in that, you know, um, in a strict sense of the word, mm. but they are just swarms that have been cited here and there. You know, some of them could be, cite, could be cited in one count, in, in, in three differ, different counties. It is the same swarm mm. that is moving across the same county. As, I mean, a the as a military man, would you say that locusts have learned to have military formations? I mean, the <laughs> military formations actually came out from swarms. So how <laughs> <laughs> from how this thing so behaves. Human, humans <laughs> learned from <laughs> locusts. Yes, in, indeed it's true. Uh -huh. uh, yes. But okay, I mean, the bigger you know, um, point here would be that uh, what we are seeing now mm. is very different from what we saw then. Mm. Mm. Right now we're talk dealing with swarms that may not be 40 by 60 kilometers, probably we're talking about 40 by 60 kilometers of swarm that when they cross into a city like Nairobi, it will be total darkness. Mm. Yes, and even aircraft <laughs> would not fly. Yeah, you know, that was quite huge. Uh, yeah, but crazy. what we're dealing with right now, uh, well, he's surprised because he didn't see. He didn't see the first one. one. Yes. Colonel <laughs> mm. Laguna, as we conclude this conversation this morning, what is it that you'd like to tell you know, people who are in those counties that are likely to be visited by these desert locusts? Indeed. You see, uh, like I did mention at the very beginning, that if you can't see it, then you can't engage it. Mm -hmm. And therefore, you know, there are two things. They must be on the lookout for these swarms. You know, and as soon as they see them, they report mm. uh, to the nearest, uh, you know, um, chief or the nearest DCC for action 
to be taken. Now, when they are advised of what action they need to take before, during, and even after spraying, let them abide by that because they're concerned about you know, the well-being of our people, mm. the health of our people. Indeed, like it was mentioned that Mira, sorry, uh, locusts do chew Mira. <laughs> they chew Mogoka, you know, the leaves, yeah. Yeah. but not the Mira stick itself, mm -hmm. you know. But certainly people are concerned about, you know, um, li livelihood. Livelihoods. Yes. Now, our situation, even during phase one and phase two, has been much, much better in the sense that uh, we received these locusts when we we're just about to go into harvesting season. Mm. Phase one and phase two as well, right? And therefore the level of destruction might not have been, has been, might not have been that bad. If we were, you know, invaded when, you know, our crops were this high, then it would have been devastating. Mm. So you're a bit lucky. Uh, and therefore to our people, they should not be so scared about planting, we are in control as a government, we have mm. mechanisms put in place to be able to effectively deal with uh, any swarms that have been cited for as long as the information is laid quickly. Mm. Thank you very much. We always believe you when you tell us the government is in control. It is in control. But today, because there's also Philip who is also saying the same thing, mm. we believe you even more. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, uh, indeed in the hands. government <laughs> this time around, and yeah. of course we have to concede that first one was a bit not as well organized, yep. which is understandable, right? You mm. know, like we say in the military, no, no plan survives contact. Yeah. <laughs> you know? <laughs> Philip? <laughs> can, uh, but maybe you can ask uh, one plan. question. Okay. Okay. Yes, yeah. we, 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 so we want to conclude the conversation, Philip, uh, because we've run out of time. Thank you very much for joining okay. us this morning. Philip Keitani of Farmers TV, joining him on KTN Farmers TV, 4 to 5 p.m. on AgriTalk and Colonel Cyrus Aguna, government spokesperson. Asante sana. Sure, we look forward to hosting you again. Every day. I'm always ready. Asante sana. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Keep it right here. The conversations continue on Spice FM. We're taking a break on KTN Home. In the next hour, we talk about <laughs> Super Tuesday. Today, MCAs in 22 counties are going to be voting on the BBI Amendment Bill. Good morning. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. La 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 Japan Biotechnology Yes Hey Samuel Are you into business now? What are you importing from Japan? Knowledge I'm going to study biotechnology In the best university in Japan I applied And ta-da Hmm, Japan? Yes. You will have to first learn Japanese. No, my friend. They have more than 850 courses that are provided in English and very affordable. Hey, ay, ay, ay. how do I apply? <laughs> <laughs> Kuja Osome Japan. Study in Japan Global Network Project brings you an opportunity to study in Japan. Log on to www.studyinjapan-africa.com and apply to study in Japan with over 100 universities providing cutting-edge science and technology courses including the field of robotics artificial intelligence, AI, environmental studies, information technology, and many more. Not only postgraduate, but undergraduate level is also covered. Mention our course, you will not fail to get it. Visit our website today on www.studyinjapan-africa.com. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Right. Like 94.4 Spice FM. Coming up to 8 o'clock. This is Kenya's biggest conversation, the Situation Room. We thank you very much for tuning in this and every weekday morning. In the next hour, let's talk to an MCA from Kambu County Government. Today, Kambu is among 21 other county assemblies that are going to be debating this BBI amendment bill. We have spoken to him before, Solo Kenudia. We have asked him why MCAs are being bribed and you told us no it's not a bribe but we'll have that conversation so you want to keep it right here our mca is being played have they received this two million shillings uh, some of them saying we must give us a two million or nothing or they're just saying it's okay it came from the president and as src has confirmed it will come okay that's the conversation in the next hour it's now eight o'clock up your life 102.5 spice fm kisumu 
Okay, traffic. so it's madness on Figaro this morning and we have traffic that's joining from Kiambu Road and trying to get on Figaro Road as well as everybody else who was on Figaro Road before that. So it's an absolute mess today. It's madness, madness, and yes, a little bit more madness on Figaro Road today. Uh, oof, it's taking some time and every day it gets a little bit worse. So this one, we have to sit through it, guys. Uh, some patience needs to apply to be applied to this. Getting off Mombasa Road as you try to get into the CBD. You're going to get stuck right around uh, the Nyan Stadium roundabout. It's slow getting into town. Uh, coming out um, from Westlands is looking pretty good, guys. Not too bad right now. Red Hill Bypass is doing wonders for folks today who don't want to get stuck uh, in Westlands and around that area. Remember that there's a barricade right around Kangeme because that footbridge is being taken down. So this one we have to watch out for as well. Okay, stepping out, looking into Mombasa. Remember, you can't pay with cash anymore at the ferry. M-Pesa only. And that's what's holding up traffic in that area as well. So please uh, plan ahead. Okay, Spice of MKE. That's how you can get in touch with us on Twitter. Text on 40127. This is The Situation Room, the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin, agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is The Situation Room. The only way to start your day. Eight. This is the third hour of the Situation Room, Kenya's biggest conversation, Spice FM, KT and Home Online. Kwame Steve, I guess, I says, uh, good morning, locked in from Busia, but having difficulty uh, and straining to hear the juicy discussion from the Situation Room. Kindly, the frequency, frequency Nigani, this part, we're using Kisumu 102.5. And he says it's weak. So 102.5 should cover Kisumu and that entire region that crosses into Busia. Our closest frequency from there, uh, Kwame, would be then the Eldoret 196.7. You can try that or just please stream online. Spice of MKE on Facebook, on Twitter, or on YouTube. You'll be able to follow the conversation or on KTN Home as well for the next one hour. Thank you very much for tuning in, Kwame. CT, today's proverb. If you carry the egg basket, do not dance. If you carry the egg basket, do not dance. Behave. If you want to dance, don't carry the egg basket. Put the egg basket down. Mm -hmm. Unless you work in a circus. <laughs> yes, and you want to show your prowess. And you have mastered the art of balancing. Yes. That's a good angle. Mm. What do you call someone who works in a circus? A circuit. <laughs> wow. Today is that day, isn't it, Eric? Mm. That day, huh? inquisitive. Well, depends on it's not so much the circuit, but it's what do they do. <laughs> People working the circus are known by the trade, the various buy. trades. Yes, mm -hmm. yes, okay. So, today uh, is what they're calling the Super Tuesday. A number of county assemblies are going to be discussing the BBI amendment bill. We already have a number that have already passed this BBI amendment bill and others are going to be discussing this BBI amendment bill today. Uh, counties in the greater Mount Kenya region, count them. Now, let's start. Meru, Embu, Kirinyaga, uh, Tharakanithi, Nyandarwa. Nyandarwa, Laikipia, Nyeri. I thought Laikipia had already got, uh, done their bit. Are they in the greater? They have they? Yes, they have. Eh? Yes. There, there is Muranga, Kiambu. Nyeri, mm -hmm. Nakuru, uh, among those ones. And then we go into Eastern. The Ukambani counties, Makweni, Kitui, Machakos. Yes. And then we have some uh, in uh, the coast. Western Past and Coast as well. Mombasa, Kilifi, uh, Kwale. Kwale, 
Those are all Taita discussing Taveta. Taveta as well. Lamu. They are discussing it today. Mm-hmm. You said Lamu? Yes. I said Lamu. Mm, good. Mm. Good. Um, Western? Western. So we have Nyanza and Western. Migori Nyamira, that's in the... Uh, Migori that's Nyamira, Nyanza. that's Nyanza. Kakamega, Bungoma. That is Western. And then we also have Isiolo is also discussing there today. Uh, Garissa is also doing that today. Rift Valley. A Rift Valley, apart from Nakuru, which is also here today. Mm -mm. Public participation phases going on. Mandera, Tana River is uh, there's still public participation being deployed. Wasingishu, Nandi, Elgeo, Maraquet, Bomet, Kericho, Masabit, Tharakanithi, Wajir, Kwale, and Turkana. Still waiting for public participation. Those that have passed the bill so far. Siaya, Kisumu, Homobe, Busia, Vihiga, Transoya, Nairobi, Kisi, West Pokot, Kajiado, Laikipia, and Samburu. And Baringo have said no. And the no still stands until that matter is resolved. Mm, until the court tells us otherwise. Mm. So, if you look at all these counties, then you look at... First of all, there's something that's interesting here. Um, which people of Siaya complained about they did not feel public participation that they were subjected to public participation by their county assembly people for example in mandera tanariva wasingishu nandi elgeo maraquet where public participation is taking place now could tell a different story people from makweni and machakos could tell a public a different story people of nairobi could tell a different story because the county assembly of nairobi actually engaged in a public participation forum where you know members of the public came into county hall and there was a whole discussion uh, before the matter was taken then to the assembly for voting so the issue of public participation uh, is is one that is emerging as it's a very important part how are you conducting the public participation the county assembly will advertise and say so there's this particular bill that's about to be discussed it's being taken to this particular committee and the committee is asking the people to come and give us their views on what they think about this bill. And then that is then taken to the committee of the whole house in the county assembly, which will vote yes or no. Public participation is important. Do the people of Seattle have a case? They do have a case, and if they're serious about it, they should take it to court. Mm. Because it is mandatory. Mm. Yes, this isn't one of those things that are suggested. It isn't something you do if you feel like it. You must. And this business of because you're the representative automatically, the public has been informed because you've been informed, doesn't fly. Something of this nature which is new, something that will change lives, that will affect, and not change for a day, for, into posterity. Mm. Yes, the public needed to have felt that their views have been taken into account, have been listened to. So even as they're being uh, represented, they're being represented from that perspective. And the complaint is that they did not, forget, not, this isn't feeling, they did not experience that. Mm. Yes. But isn't it this way? It, it, it always is. I think there's a lot of attention on it now because talking about the BBI. But isn't that the way in which public participation has been carried out and people not feeling as though their views have been adequately represented, mm. not just with the BBI, but other things that go on other county to well. county, mm. other business that happens whereby they're supposed to be um, approached when some things like this come out and their opinion is supposed to be given, their um, uh, contribution then is supposed to be listened to and heard and then that is what is used to make the decision. So if people are feeling at this point that, okay, because of this BBI, I don't feel as if I participated, it's not just with the BBI. I think it needs to show them, it needs to come up very clearly that in terms of public participation across the country and from county to county, then it really doesn't happen in the manner in which it's supposed to happen anyway. And a BBI is just, the BBI is just an example of how things don't work. I think we can say there are some loopholes that are always exploited. Mm. You see, how do you define public participation? 
in, for some people, it's that she wrote that a letter. Public participation <laughs> is a baraza that must be held in every sub county or in every ward, or is public participation one forum that is held at the county headquarters and that has brought in a representative from various sectors? So and you can say there were youth, there were women, there were people from the civil society and community uh, based organizations, there were people from uh, business sector, there were people from this, this, and the other. So it was representative public participation that brought together 35 people. <laughs> Whereas you represent uh, hundreds of thousands. Yeah. Uh, so those people. There's no direct definition of, of what shall constitute public participation. Now I think therein lies where that needs to happen, mm. so that you say that this and this and this activity is what was carried out, and therefore we carried out proper public participation. For some people, is that a letter was written, and we sent out an email address, and we asked people to write in, yep. or we asked people to visit this office. Whether they responded to the email, whether they actually visited that office, is not the issue. Mm. That you put out that initial communication without realizing that communication is two-way, that you send out information, and then you get feedback on the same for the process to be complete, that's not taken into consideration. Yeah. So I think the lines of public participation really need to be looked at and drawn properly so that we know. Because when you when we've had several petitions taken to court saying that public participation actually didn't happen, upon which threshold then is this being judged? Yeah. Because I think those lines initially need to be drawn and say, if this is the form of public public participation, then you choose to engage in. These are the things that then must happen as a result of this form. If they don't, upon that threshold, then can you come and say public participation did or did not occur? Mm. But right now, I think the, the, the lines are a bit blurry in terms of, okay, so we called a meeting. 50 people showed up. Yep. We displayed our agenda. We discussed. We went home. As far as the conveners of the meeting are concerned, public participation they took the place. Public. Other people on that particular day, maybe they were not there for whatever reason. Somebody mm. had to go to hospital, something else happened, they were in another part of the country. As far as they were concerned, they did not know. So public participation did not happen. And it cannot be relative. It cannot be opinionated. It's either there or it was not. And so I think by the time we're talking about there must be public participation, I think the lines need to be with, re redrawn. And again, it's the BBI that's showing all of this now. There's so much county business that goes on that requires public participation. Things that should have happened in a certain way and maybe did not because it didn't occur. <laughs> so now it's coming out in the open because the BBI is a national dis uh, conversation. But remember, all this public participation discussion is premised on something very fundamental. Mm. Sovereign power is vested in the people of Kenya. People yep. means everybody. Mm. Yep. Irrespective of what you think, what you believe, what you don't believe, that doesn't matter. Yep. Now, the model that even has been lauded by the World Bank that is used is the level in Makweni, mm. where people even determine what projects they believe they ought to actually be involved in. And the process of budgeting and allocating funds is based on that. So the people genuinely are engaged. And from what we've been told, the governor himself attends these, not some, mm. attends these functions. So he knows what the people want. Remember, you've heard me mention this, that there was an MP in Nyando mm. a while back, uh -huh. okay, who had similar practices. He would not determine for the wards what they wanted. No, no, no. He was called Engineer Eric Nyamunga. He still is called because mm. he's still alive. But people would decide. So whatever funds were located from the CDF were for the projects that you and your people had determined you wanted. What he would do is just probably inspect to determine whether you said you're doing what you're doing. Uh -huh. Now, that is public participation. There are people. How was he conducting this forum? Was he going house to door to door? Was he no, calling no, 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 no. You, you village, call public village, but village every meetings? ward, you, you, you call a meeting, there's a chief, there's a, there's a sub chief. So in every ward, there's a meeting. Those, those are days of counselor. Uh -huh. And then the, the people come. You know, on this day, you're told in advance, on this day, the MP will be coming to this to meet us to discuss these things. Mm -hmm. Yes. And so this is this is now then all this information is collected. Yes. And is there feedback? This is what you guys have said. We yes. as many as of and a this is the and, and this is, Yes, and this is the money that we, we have. Mm. The, you even talk about the priority. This is what we want. Okay, prioritize it. So mm. you prioritize and says, okay, this is the money that we have, and this is how we are dividing it. Mm. So even in your words, you know how much money has been allocated. Mm. So it, it, it isn't that you can guess, you know. When we get to the next year, we'll be able to allocate this. Year one, this is what we plan to do yeah. with this money. Yeah. This is where your money has gone. That is what McQueenie also does. Now, there may be other counties that do the same thing. But for this to be an issue, it means the other counties that have this a bit vague, it's cloudy. You're not really sure because 
One, you may not have heard of a meeting being called. And mm. if it was called, uh, you don't know who was called or, yes. or who went. Mm. The accountants that even have meetings when they're discussing their budgets. Now, if people choose not to go and then complain later, but the opportunity was provided. Mm -hmm. What I haven't heard plenty of is meetings where the counties actually get to tell their people what they have done in the course of the year. I don't hear much of that. I guess those budget review meetings or the budget making meetings will start with a review. Last year, this was what uh, the budget was supposed to have done and you guys have, have not done it. So what are we talking about? So we need to allocate more money, more resources into this or kill that project. Let's move on to the so next So that, that meeting has actually ended before it has been done. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Should we have a threshold? You know, like, for example, in this particular, if we go to a referendum and we are likely to go to a referendum, everything, uh, all the indications are showing us that, there's a threshold of then what happens in the referendum. If at least 20% of registered voters in a county participate in that ballot, then that county is uh, said to have participated in the referendum. If less than 20% of registered voters in a particular county actually don't turn up to, to the knee, then that, strike it out. And then you must have the referendum passed by half of the country. So there are certain threshold. Should we say the same kind of thing and say, if you're talking about public participation, public participation shall happen at ward level. And registered voters in a ward level, a certain percentage of registered voters at a ward level must participate in this public participation forum. And this is how you're going to collect their data and show that they actually indeed participated. If you don't meet that threshold, then you cannot say that you had public participation. You can't say you did public participation where you only called your cronies in a particular ward as MCA and you sat down at your place and you change and boozy and then you say, ah, there was public participation. Mm. We met and people discussed and people were given an opportunity. We had already announced this thing. We sent SMSs to various WhatsApp groups and in, in the county and then people did not turn up. If they chose not to turn up, that's their problem. Absolutely not. Mm -mm. It is your responsibility to make sure that people participate as well. I think there's a government responsibility here to encourage people to participate. Why don't people participate? Find out. Why is it that as a government, I'm running a government and I'm running a public participation and people are not turning up? You see, the, if, you lo if you talk about meetings that we know, we know we always talk about chiefs barazas. Eh? Mm. Not all of them are consultative meetings. It's one way. Mm. You, you are called so that you can be told Okay, Now, this culture of actually allowing people to air their views, mm. it's not something that we have witnessed as being supportive of many administrative or government-related administrative units. Mm. They call you to tell you. They even decide on the number of questions you're going to ask. Whereas a meeting such as this one, it can't be, you can't have it for an hour. Yeah. At least half a day. So that people actually get to say what they need to say. And it also gives people time to do what they need to do early in the morning and then have time to even come for the meetings. So even the time when you call the meetings is important. Do you mm. think that there is adequate interest uh, in terms of the responsibility then that citizens have to participate in these processes? Because we can talk about it all we want mm. and say that, you know, it's public participation on the side of the government leader is actually a responsibility to push and make sure that it happens. Yes, Right? It's their responsibility to make sure that people are involved in these processes of county business. I think so. But then, also on the side of the people, is there enough interest to say, okay, when this is gazetted, for example, when the notice is sent out, am I thinking about the things that I have to do? Or am I realizing that also when I'm called upon to participate in this process, that I am actively involved in mm. actually going to participate? So that when these things happen... And all this noise is made about there was not adequate public participation. Can I actually raise my hand as a citizen and say I participated in this process or that I wanted to? Do we have, do we have, in, is there really enough, enough interest we, in the people? Yeah. I think there'd be interest in the yes. people. It's a chicken and egg situation for me here. If, if the government was actually genuinely engaging the people, then people will have interest. Hmm. Because if you go and sit in a meeting for half a day, and you are given an opportunity to raise your concerns, you're given an opportunity to air your views, and then you can see your views being taken, you will participate again. Mm. And if you all agree on a, something of priority and you see it being done, yep. you'll attend the next meeting. You'll attend the next one. But remember, part of engaging the community has to do with empowering them. Okay? Mm. 
making them understand why it is important for them to actually bring themselves physically to those meetings and why it is important for them to participate okay there are more there are communities that are more of a debating society than others okay yes there the, are the people who you call a gathering and ask for opinions they mm. will happily come and give their opinions mm. there are others where people are not that given to giving their opinions not really so part of this process the leader has to take it upon themselves to utilize the resources available within the county whether it is civil society whether it is church meetings whatever form of gathering that people involved in mm. use those forums to pass this same message across so that when a meeting is called there is that understanding and this is something that you do once a year mm -mm. it has to be continuous i think it's actually a way in to some of these answers or uh, solutions that we keep talking about and looking for here. When you're asking yourself then, how do the people upon whom rests this power and responsibility then really become actively involved in leadership and governance, right? To say that uh, you're then uh, holding people that you voted in accountable for their deeds, what they will do while they're in government. Mm. I think this is a way into that uh, because we have very many examples of countries whereby people are extremely active. Every Friday, for example, there's a town hall and people are discussing something as menial as the name that a road is going to be to be called, yes. what their children are eating in school for lunch. Yes. And this is people of a particular ward coming and sitting with their ward representative there yep. who is not making a decision aside from what people have discussed on that particular day. And people take it seriously, as seriously as they do as paying their taxes or yes. doing yes. something else. And those else. people will have a representative. Forget the ward rep. Mm -mm. Other people in the community who will actually go. Who send their representatives yes. to attend yes. this meeting. And then somebody who is coming back and saying, you know what, this is what we discussed on that particular day. If we see a piece of legislation then coming through and it is not what we agreed or it does not contain some of the contributions than we that then that we made at that time then there is further discourse and debate on it and saying hold on a minute this mm. is not what we agreed mm. so what you have is collective governance and i think that's what we are missing out on because a lot of people sit back and say well then how do i participate in in a government that i see is failing and people ask me then what is my role and my responsibility i think there are very many avenues where people can get involved but i hear you when you say then that those then who carry the mantle and this responsibility of making sure that people are um um, involved in this process don't do it enough. And I think one of the reasons why is because they don't want to be held accountable. Uh, if you see that uh, there's a push for people to be involved, then it's kind of like an invitation to That's say, it. come and hold me accountable for this job that you gave me to do. If you ask very many uh, politicians, they'll tell you, uh, you allow this thing to be like that, then people will just come there. Your opponent will sponsor people to come and you know disrupt your meeting. People mm. will come into question. What a letter siasa kwa mkutano. Mm. And that's what you, not what you want. You want as a Mweshimiwa to come, sit there, let two people talk, and then you stand up and tell people what uh, is and, going and to be done. And dictate. Mm. Yeah, you're so, telling so, them what is going to happen. So any thinking member of your community will not bother going because they know exactly what's going to happen yep. mm. and they're really not interested. But remember, if, if we're talking about empowerment, sometimes I feel the group that needs this empowerment the most are people who want to assume leadership. Mm. Because they get in there with a lordship mentality. They pretend to be people, persons, but they're actually lord of, lords of the people. Yeah. They want to come there and dictate and tell you what to do yeah. and how to do it and, and in detail. And they don't entertain any differing views. But unfortunately, public participation brings about that. That's precisely what it does. The very views that you hadn't thought of or you probably didn't want, you will get to hear them. Hmm. Now, if... Remember the word, uh, this word we were discussing earlier on the, uh, in the morning, siege. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The one otherwise known as... Mm -hmm. mm. Leaders, I think, get into leadership and then have this siege mentality. They feel that unless they have absolute control of the situation, absolute control means you don't allow too many voices, especially divergent voices. Yeah. And you're thinking... <laughs> You think you're the only person who thinks in this community. <laughs> and that's so that everything that you say is, is what people will go by. You want to come in and tell people what is going to happen. Yes. Because you are the Muheshimiwa. Yes. All right. So because I'm the Muheshimiwa, I called the meeting. I called the meeting to inform you. It is my meeting. It is my meeting. Mm. And that's why a Muheshimiwa can even say, Ntamaliza <laughs> imkutano. Yes. Because you Mumeanza Kulete Siasa, I will finish this meeting. It is my meeting. 
you cannot and bring you cannot come and bring chaos to my meeting mm. as far as they are concerned they call the meeting to come and tell you any discussion any question a genuine question is seen as disruptive and all somebody has done is asked mm. and they'll be guess they'll say get that person out of here yes why are they bringing this noise and the person has asked a genuine question says mm. sure, you know you, last time you said this and what has happened what are you asking abbas we have people in leadership who do not want to be questioned they do not want to be accountable mm. that's really what it boils down to they don't and they don't feel like they have a responsibility and that's why we're saying even look at the case of makweni and other counties that have you know done it this way when governor kivuza kibwana is talking to the people he is basically listening to the people yes he is that is what the public participation is listen to the people and then go and implement what the people yes. want and if you go and check the level and the degree of attendance of those meetings uh. by the people in Makueni compared to other counties you'll find that, that one is higher why because people feel that there's a there's a reason there's reason for me to attend and there's something that's going to come out of it i'm going to get to get my voice heard mm. and i'm going to get an output out of that meeting it's not a waste of time So if I go in there and I raise an issue and maybe uh, a majority of people disagree I'll know a majority of people disagree but I'll have voiced my concern and raised my issue. Absolutely. Taking a break now 26 minutes after 8 we are live on KT and Home and Spice FM and online. We are having a conversation about public participation especially now that county assemblies are discussing the BBI amendment bill 22 counties are set to have that conversation today on the BBI amendment bill 22 of them That's why media is calling them the Super Tuesday. This is the Super Tuesday. If those 22 basically all of them go and say yes today, done and dusted. IBC can start telling us when the referendum is going to be. Oh, there's that court case. Uh, mm. uh, no, they can't. Well, we can start thinking about the referendum. <laughs> okay? And planning for it. And start planning as you, for as we wait for the court. Wait for the courts to make up mm. their minds. Mm-hmm. Fall in line. Time for a break. We'll be back shortly. Good morning. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Spice up your life. La 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 la. Japan by technology. Yes. Hey, Samuel, are you into business now? What are you importing from Japan? Knowledge. I'm going to study biotechnology in the best university in Japan. I applied and ta-da! Hmm, Japan? Yes. You will have to first learn Japanese. No, my friend. They have more than 850 courses that are provided in English and very affordable. Hey, ay ay how do I apply? <laughs> Kuja Osome Japan. Study in Japan Global Network Project brings you an opportunity to study in Japan. Log on to www.studyinjapan-africa.com and apply to study in Japan with over 100 universities providing cutting-edge science and technology courses including the field of robotics artificial intelligence ai environmental studies information technology and many more not only postgraduate but undergraduate level is also covered mention our course you will not fail to get it visit our website today on www.studyinjapan-africa.com all right so mostly cloudy conditions for now in nairobi the sun's going to peek through without um, much longer notice we're going to see highs of 25 today in nairobi nyeri mostly cloudy at 15 highs of 23 Mostly cloudy conditions in Nakuru at 16, highs of 24. 22, the high in Eldoret. Mostly cloudy at 15 at the moment today. We'll see highs of 29 in Kisumu, mostly cloudy at 20. Mostly cloudy in Kakamega, 21 degrees. Highs of 28 and lows of 15. We'll see 32, the high in Mombasa today. Mostly cloudy at 27. 27 is also going to be the lucky number in Malindi. Highs of 31 and lows of 26. Highs of 27 and partly sunny conditions in Kampala where it's mostly cloudy in Dar es Salaam at 25 we'll see highs of 29 we'll see highs of 23 in Johannesburg 16 degrees at the moment and cloudy hazy still in Lagos at 26 going to highs of 34 and it's mostly sunny for a change in Kinshasa going to highs of 31 and lows of 23 Spice up your life. Traffic. Well, I forgot to tell you, it's an and seven.
um, are actually looking pretty good today. Uh, not too much of an issue. Uh, you can use those without any problems. Um, Red Hill Bypass also looking good if you can get out of what's going on around Westlands to get through to that. Uh, where we're having problems today is Tika Road. Uh, Kiambu Road also is quite the mishmash. Then trying to join the Thika Superhighway around the Pangani Tunnel. Then out towards Ngara. It's going to slow down a little bit. Wangari Madhai Way, however, today is looking pretty good. You can use that. Coming off of Mombasa Road, you're going to get stuck right around uh, the Nyasin Roundabout. And then out into the city. It's moving slowly. We're not at a bumper to bumper just yet. Coming off of Jogo Road, Landy's Road, CBD is looking good, guys. Let's see what else might hold you up. Let us know. Spice of MKE on Twitter. Text 40127. Spice up your life. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. It's now half past eight. The conversation continues right here at the Situation Room. Spice FM, Katie and Home and online in the room this and every weekday morning. You have CT Muga, Nduoko and Eric Latif. We are having a conversation about Super Tuesday. 22 county assemblies due to discuss the BBI amendment bill today. If all of them pass this, we are done and dusted. It'll be 22 plus 12F. That makes it what? <laughs> 34. 34 <laughs> county assemblies will have passed it. They only need 24. And I think the BBI Secretariat wants 100%. They're not going for short of that. Joining us now is uh, one of the members of the county assembly that's going to be uh, discussing this matter today. The MCA for Ndenderu Ward in Kiambu County, Solomon Kinuthia. Good morning, Solo. Uh, good morning, uh, Eric. Thank you very much for joining us. Welcome to the Situation Room in person. Uh, thank you very much. It's a <laughs> great pleasure to join you in person. Very good. Yes. So we were talking about uh, the county assemblies and seeing that there are some that are still conducting public participation. We saw the statement from the uh, governor of uh, Makweni County yesterday you know, uh, after some public participation sessions with the public and then with MCAs in conjunction with Machakos County. Has Ka Kiambu conducted any public participation? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, mm. In line with the Public Participation Act uh, mm. that was uh, recently enacted uh, by the Senate. Mm -hmm. And uh, we invited a memorandum from the public and we, con uh, we conducted a, a town hall meeting in uh, two days running. Mm. Uh, where we listened to the public and of course uh, we would have wanted to go to the sub-counties and the wards but the prevailing uh, COVID situation made us uh, want to reduce yeah. and balance off uh, <laughs> the <continue>. public interactions, <laughs> uh, interactions uh, mm. uh, because uh, we are faced uh, with a situation that's very unique that uh, last faced the entire world in uh, 1920s, 1919, 1918, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. when uh, Benito Mussolini mm -hmm. was mm -hmm. in power. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we elected to minimize public interactions in Kambu, as well as uh, appreciate the place of uh, electronic communication. Okay. And uh, uh, we overwhelmingly received the support for the BBI. Hmm. I was going to ask, how did that bill. work out? And when you say overwhelming support, how did that come through? What did you see that would then now say? Was uh, from the emails ah. that came in, uh -huh. from the memoranda, from uh, civil society, from the neighborhood association, they are all in support of uh, uh, the increasingly uh, devolvement of uh, funds to the grassroots, mm. and also uh, the many other uh, amendments to the constitutions that uh, assures uh, the public of a greater role of uh, the civil society, the public, in uh, the determination of the uh, place of uh, justice and uh, economic equity. Okay. of uh, the citizens in uh, public life. Okay. Yes. 
So are you saying that there was overwhelming support in terms of numbers? Yes. Or are you saying that from the responses you got, yes. these issues are the ones that received overwhelming attention? You know, for Kambu, uh. uh, BBI uh, is a welcome uh, intervention okay. in terms of uh, resource allocation mm. and representation. Because uh, Kambu has about uh, 2.5 uh, uh, gazetted uh, numbers in terms of uh, the last census. And uh, currently we have only about uh, 12 MPs. Via BBI we are going to have about 18 MPs. Mm. And there is a cardinal principle uh, that uh, there should be no taxation without representation. Mm. Again in terms of uh, resource allocation, we are going to get uh, double the current uh, allocation in terms of uh, uh, equitable share from the treasury. In terms of CDF, we are going to get extra six constituencies with uh, about uh, 136 million mm. in terms of uh, CDF share. And also, in terms of voice, in terms of uh, regional uh, issues, we are mm. going to get about six extra MPs. So we don't anticipate uh, opposition to the constitutional amendment bill. In terms of uh, also empowering MCAs to be a voice in the grassroots, we are going to get about uh, 20, 25 million as a dedicated fund mm. for grassroots uh, development. If the BBI passes? If it passes. Okay. So we got uh, overwhelming support because our local issues were addressed. Mm -hmm. Again, if um, we go back in history, from 1983, after the attempted coup of 1982, mm -hmm. we saw a serious push by the then President uh, Moi to consolidate power. And he did so by making sure he created an artificial majority in parliament and all other organs of uh, governance, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, this he did by gerrymandering uh, areas that are scarcely populated and uh, having more constituencies at the expense of places like Nyanza, Western Kenya, Central Kenya. Mm -hmm. okay? you, know, you, know, you do know we are going to challenge that view, but continue. Fine, uh, <laughs> we are getting there. And I would want to be enlightened uh, and I would want to appreciate uh, a different opinion. Yes. So... BBI is uh, coming very late in the day to address uh, issues that uh, were very negative to highly populated areas in this country since 1983. And Kiambu being one of the very densely populated areas, we see no reason why Actually, we should not one, celebrate one of the most, this no, day. No, not very, one of the most, dense. most mm. densely yes. populated yes. We saw Peredram sector die a very undeserved death. Mm. We saw tea and coffee sector die. We saw the emergence of the uh, Matatu sector, which has not addressed the issue of employment in Kiambu since 1983. So we are seeing an advent of uh, a system of governance that would address our own misgivings about the structure of governance since 1983-84. Mm. To date, which is about uh, what? 38 years. Mm. Most of us were not born by then, mm. but we bear the brunt of uh, the governance system and the excesses of then that are being addressed in the BBI system. Right. So we see no reason <laughs> why we should oppose mm. this very welcome system of <laughs> governance that has come on board. Uh, much more, you put it so beautifully. I, I want to take you back. Huh? Yes. When you talked about the bill that the Senate passed, huh? yes. The details of this bill with regards to public participation, mm. what were they? Meaning point one, these are the things they said must be part and parcel of this process that we're talking about. And how do you align that to what you did to ensure that you had met the basic tenets of public participation? If you look at the public participation bill, uh, uh, act rather, because act. Uh, it's already it hasn't, been enacted. It hasn't gone, yes, correct. Uh, it's been enacted. Uh, um, one, uh, there is uh, 
the option of uh, accepting a memoranda from the public. Mm-hmm. There's also the option of uh, going to the grassroots and hearing it from the people and uh, compiling reports. Mm-hmm. So granted that even as we sit here, we are observing uh, COVID uh, protocols. Mm-hmm. If we decide to travel uh, outside this country, we would have also to observe uh, the protocols that are binding by the times that we, living, uh, we are living in. Mm-hmm. Uh, Kambu is densely populated. If we were to travel across the land and interact with the 12 sub-counties, would have, of course, uh, encouraged the spread of COVID. So we adopted the memoranda system where we can have a town hall system mm. for two, three days running in Kambu County. Mm. And we could also advertise in uh, three or four uh, newspapers of national circulation mm-hmm. where public and we agree from the census that uh, was recently done in 2019 that uh, 7 out of 10 members of public are below the age of 35 and they are ICT compliant mm-hmm. so they are able to access our platforms and give us views so going by that we elected to do town hall meetings in the capital city of uh, Kiambu. Mm-hmm. So the, the town Kiambu. hall meeting happened only in Kiambu town. Yes. And who attended this? Civil societies, uh, neighborhood associations. Right. Uh, normal and inches. And uh, it pains me to call them normal because they are my employers. And ordinarily, and how many it people? Was a, uh, it was a pain you to call uh, your employer here or the head of uh, radio here. Uh, normal, normal CEO. Because uh, he is your employer. But... Uh, as you would want uh, us to call them, they are... No, we don't, we, we don't want you to call them number one. I just <laughs> no. say citizens came. Citizens. So, <laughs> how yes. many people attended this meeting? About uh, three, four thousand. And uh, we four thousand received people. also... Over, over the three days. days. Over the three days or yes. every day there were three thousand, four thousand people? Um, uh, Two thousand uh, each day. Mm. And then uh, also from the diaspora and from the length of breadth of Kiambu, we received also electronic... Memoranda. Corres- correspondence. Mm. Uh, What's the town hall capacity from, uh, in Mishmeo? It's big. We have a big compound eh, in mm. Kiambu. And we also benchmark and uh, leverage on technology. Mm. Because uh, from the county assembly, we have about uh, an acre or two of open space. Okay. Mm. Then next, we have the county commissioner's uh, offices. Which is mm. literally he next also though. has uh, three acres. Mm. So with the uh, projectors and all that. So you erected tents we, and that this is what yes, happened. Yes, uh, we were able to host uh, people and then uh, we observed uh, social distancing. Okay. Yes. And then how was this now conducted, the, the three-day event? We heard from the public. So the people would stand up and say, Yes, they would submit. This is what they think about the, yes. the BBI amendment bill. Yes. Had you made sure that by the time people are coming for this meeting, they have seen a copy of the BBI amendment bill and interacted with it? Yes, I, as I said earlier, that, um, and uh, you've seen studies uh, to this effect, uh, that uh, most one inch is uh, ICT compliant. Mm. And we make sure that uh, they are aware where they can download a copy of the BBI. Mm. So we publicized uh, the link, mm-hmm. and uh, most members of the public, besides us printing uh, enough copies for people who attended, mm. uh, they were aware of uh, the contents of the BBI, I mean, by Bill. Well, there are some people who... And uh, mind you, uh. Uh, the committee on BBI that was chaired by the late uh, Honorable uh, Yusuf Haji mm. visited Kambu, and they collected views which uh, were collated and they were, you know, condensed into the BBI bill. So for the past two years, the BBI bill is a product of uh, a robust process of public participation. So what we are doing at the county assembly is just to counter check whether all they did when the Yusuf Haji committee was in Kambu County was captured within uh, the substance of the BBI bill. Mm. Well, there are people who would stand up in this forum yes. and say, I oppose this bill or I oppose this particular specific amendment for specific Yes, uh, we had quite a number. There was concern about uh, the perceived 
uh, expanded uh, registrature mm -hmm. and the perceived expanded uh, executive arm of government. Mm -hmm. But uh, these are issues that are explained away. Because uh, when uh, we exist within uh, a global uh, community, mm. recently I'm sure all of us here, we are followers of international news. Mm. And we saw Italy, which has a population of about uh, 60 million, mm. uh, doing a resolution to reduce their number of uh, representation in Senate and Parliament, National Assembly, from 900 to 600. Mm -hmm. Uh, the BBI bill proposes we have about uh, 50 million yep. Kenyans. We are only proposing to expand the size of the legislature to about uh, 500. Mm. So we are within <laughs> the international man, uh, you know. With one country as an example. Okay. <laughs> no, it's not. Uh, we are getting there, sorry. Uh, in the United States, uh, uh, they are thinking of uh, expanding uh, the size of uh, the Congress mm. from uh, 435 mm to about uh, 900 mm. because uh, there is a slavery heritage for the number 435 mm. because 435 assumed that the black people, uh, people of the black descent, did not represent uh, a, full a full vote. vote. Mm. So there was an assumption that uh, <laughs> all uh, people of black descent represented two thirds. Mm. So there is a congressman in the U.S. who is challenging that assumption right. currently. Mm. If you look at uh, France, they have about 950 in Senate and the Congress. Mm. And world over, even in Rwanda and South Africa, mm, the number of representatives is not a function or is not subject to the GDP. Mm -hmm. It's subject to the population. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are going to grow this economy. We are going By to and browns mm. okay. because in 2003 mm. we were at uh, a gdp of about 500 million mm -hmm. mm. currently we have a gdp of about three trillion mm -hmm. mm. we are able to expand this economy mm -hmm. previously we thought uh, the kenyan That's economy okay, but justify <laughs> the representation <laughs> the representation that we are talking about now with must that, we which have is that representation available. worst case scenario <laughs> we are looking at uh, 532 in both senate and the National Assembly. Justify that representation. Do we need to have... And uh, the reason why we are doing this is because uh, the cultural attitude of most voters mm -hmm. is that they would not vote for women. Mm -hmm. Okay, fine. But we also recognize that women are taxpayers. And you cannot have uh, taxation without representation. Currently, from the Gazette Census numbers, women stand at 52% of the Kenyan population. Mm -hmm. If you look at uh, the elected representatives, we're only able to do about 10% women. Mm -hmm. So this is an issue we have to address through affirmative action until such a point when uh, the Kenyan populace embrace women representation. And you, in order to do this, you need more people in order to make this uh, stick as an idea. Uh, not just more people. If you look at the BBI bill, mm. we are going to place the responsibility of assuring that we have a two-thirds uh, observance of the gender bill, of the gender rule, on the political parties. Mm. And for political parties to, ac to access 15% of the political party funding, they must at least present a nomination list that has a uh, one that gender rule mm. gender rule so we are placing the banded where it belongs All the right. political parties which mm. well let's say i buy what you're saying mm. now let us look at other problems yes. that we have mm. uh not only problems that we have but which are we are alive with us on a daily basis the number of teachers we have in public schools vis-a-vis -vis the number of students the number of healthcare workers we have vis-a-vis -vis the population. Mm -hmm. Okay? Those the are problems. Police officers. Vis -vis police, vis -vis uh, vis -vis. Thank you very much. We, uh, you see, this is the good thing of having colleagues who understand where you're going with the discussion. Mm -hmm. And I could go on. So am I to take it that with if this, these numbers that you say are justifiable, are they justifiable in helping mm -hmm. solve these problems that we have and which you continually have? Remember, we still have health workers on strike because the one thing that everything we're saying does, it raises the wage bill. Mm -hmm. the, you can't run away from that. Now, 
Some may argue, but oh, well, you see, health workers, are more, all that we understand. But there is a way in which these problems can be solved. Are we saying that what you've just presented eloquently and well will take us along that path where all these problems will then be solved? Uh, there's a place I would want us uh, to go back to, okay. and uh, I would wish we just had time. Eh? Mm. Mm. Because uh, in 2004, uh, President uh, Mwai Kibaki appreciated the role that a qualified and motivated uh, civil service mm. would help uh, push uh, economic recovery mm. in the country. And uh, appreciating that, he appointed uh, one of his special advisors, uh, Stanley Murage, mm. and uh, a university professor from uh, Canada called uh, Joyce, uh, Joyce, uh, I think, uh, Maraga. Uh, from Nyamwea, uh, Nyamwea, sorry, Nyamwea. Thank you very much, <laughs> Nyamwea. And then uh, after they did the study, they realized so that we pull the best from the private sector to the public sector to drive uh, recovery and uh, reasoning and uh, policy formulation, we have to pay commensurate mm. rates that the private sector is paying both at home and abroad. Right. Fine. So uh, the reform uh, policies so as they attract uh, the likes of uh, Mogo Kefati, who came in to drive the vision 2030, and many others, uh, professionals from the private sector to the public sector. Um, those reforms uh, so as uh, even draw uh, a person like uh, Professor Nikal mm. from the private sector, eh? He came in into politics because now politics uh, was paying well. So, <laughs> hey. <laughs> hey. wow! <laughs> Professor Nikal came from public service. <laughs> he came from. He went to politics no, because no. politics was paying. Let's in just go with the flow. <laughs> let's just go with the flow. Okay. Please, carry Fine, on yeah. the flow. Let, let's go. Carry on. Uh, carry on uh, yeah, the flow. Yes. So, so Nikal, uh, <laughs> and you saw Professor Nikal uh, is able to empathize with the fate and the plight the of health of workers. Health, uh, when uh, they appeared before the Committee on Health in Parliament. So we want to have a situation where um, people serving in uh, the public sector mm. and the people who are oversighting them in Parliament and the county assemblies can both relate. Okay? Mm -hmm. So we have a situation where uh, we are having an issue with the public wage bill. Uh, but if you look at it, what is the issue? Um, the doctors uh, are demanding for more in terms of uh, risk allowances. Eh? Uh, the teachers uh, would want, in terms of the ratio of teacher to student ratio. M Mishmiro, I, yes. want to, I want to interrupt you. You know why this problem arises? Eh? Yes. You know, yes. when people talk of inflation, eh? yes. it means mm. that the cost of just living yes. is running ahead of everything else. Okay? So, a tomato which used for you for, for 10 bob you could get 10 tomatoes now you get one tomato for 10 bob okay so if this bbi that you people support could talk about ensuring that our cost of living goes down this need for these high salaries wouldn't arise because your salary wouldn't be that much but you'd be able to, to live on it but if you keep increasing salaries all you're doing is you're increasing inflation I agree with you entirely. But what the BBI is uh, envisioning to do yes. is to create an environment where more producers, whether local or from uh, abroad, would uh, aspire to come into Kenya and produce here. How but is I'm it sorry, doing? What is you it? have? That, eh? is the, that is the job of government anyway. <laughs> this is economics. Huh? How is BBI anyway? doing? This is economics you are talking. To, to foster, because, uh, to foster what, uh, an environment What Siti Muga is talking about is a uh, wage push inflation. Eh? Uh -huh. mm -hmm. And the way to reduce the wage push inflation is to increase, increase production. Yes. So that uh, with the little that you're paid, you're able to buy more. But yes. My point is that that yes. is the job of government anyway to create and, uh, a conducive environment through which all these things yes, can Yes, and be governments done. elsewhere. The documents should not have uh, to come in now to do Recently, that. a study came out uh, uh. about uh, who is doing better and who is doing worse than Kenya. <laughs> and people who have amended their constitution 17 times, like South Africa, mm. Nigeria, are mm. doing better than Kenya. We are placed number six in Africa in terms of uh, GDP. South Africa is number two just after Nigeria, who is gifted in terms of uh, petroleum. Mm. So South Africa, since 1996, ha has amended their constitution 17 times. 
Rwanda has done it about 10 times. India, who is doing the better and is the greatest uh, democracy uh, globally, has done it one or three times since 1950. So constitutional amendments to frame the way we go about governance is a welcome way. Uh, the USA has done it 35 times. Mm. It's the most stable democracy in the world. So there's nothing sinister in us attempting to amend our constitution 10 years after inauguration. And you remember, 40% of the population <laughs> agreed in 2010 that we have a problem with this document. So, Lord, you realize you have not answered the question. <laughs> so, exactly how is BBI <laughs> going, to, going to attract going to FDI? FDI. Because uh, you realize, and uh, this is an issue that uh, economists have agreed, mm. that uh, one year prior and one year after the general election, we are so polarized mm. that uh, instead of attracting foreign direct investment, we are pushing it away, okay? Mm. And uh, we realize the issue with uh, our own elections is that uh, winner takes it all. And we are very polarized, uh, ethnically M mobilized Mwishiwa, 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 This one I have to interrupt. <laughs> this is an issue that uh, I, I, we need this one uh, allow, to Please forgive me. I really have to interrupt <laughs> you here because one of the biggest contributors to what you're calling direct foreign investment is not anything you're saying. Yes. It's the cost of power in this country. The cost of doing business for any would-be investor is so high that they look at it and... At the, the, the culprit at the center of it is how much our power costs. People look around and they figure, you know, I can actually do this thing next door. Yep. No, no, no. You yes. single out uh, the cost of power, but uh, yes, uh, that uh, plays in part to attracting FDI. It's a contributory but role <laughs> to making a conducive the business environment. Disturbances. Let, let me interrupt you. Yes. About, yes. Uh, yes. 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 I, I want to say, <laughs> because we'd like to it's say thank you very player. much to our audience on KTN Home who've been with us since 7 o'clock. We have in the studio with us Solomon Kinodia. He is an MCA for Dendero Ward in Kiambu County. Kiambu is one of uh, 22 counties that are going to be discussing the BBI Amendment Bill today. And uh, all indications are that Kiambu is geared to vote overwhelmingly. Mm unanimously yes to the bbi so solo is giving us a rundown of how they have arrived to uh, this particular point you can tune in to spice fm ktn home 94.4 in nairobi mombasa is 87.9 102.5 in kisumu 96.0 in nakuru 96.7 eldoret 90.9 in yeri and 97.7 in malindi this conversation continues into the next hour on spice fm good morning One hundred two point five Spice FM, Kisumu. Okay, so here we are. We, we still have uh, the Indendero Board MCA. The, the, the conversation we're having is is power is one of the things that yes. is actually pushing Key contributors yes. out of the country, going to neighboring countries. Ethiopia has taken a lot, but of of, uh, of industries from this country. Egypt, some of the... Uh, Uganda, yeah, Rwanda, Uganda, Rwanda. Rwanda. Even Tanzania. Is and it and political and stability? And I say it's a classical question of uh, which comes before the other, the yeah. egg or the chicken. Because <laughs> those countries that you mentioned that have been able to stabilize the cost of power, mm. they also have stabilized the cost of uh, political contest and their political, uh, overall political environment. Mm -hmm. Actually, uh, people who want to come, we are naturally gifted in this conversation ha, is going to be with me interrupting you. You know, Mwishimiwa, yes. it is not true. Mm. Other than Italy, Kenya <laughs> is the greatest producer of geothermal <laughs> energy, okay? Mm -hmm. Why yes. are investors going to Italy to harness geothermal energy mm. and Canada and bypassing Kenya? It's all because of... Uh, Political instability? It is because their energy, even though we have vast resources of geothermal, yes. how much you pay at the bill is still very high. Yes, because we seem to insist on somehow, because of contractual issues, buying power that is expensively produced and the by, uh, the by various, generators. And the that's why I agree that uh, are put in entirely by the government. with the president. The government said, comes up with a tariff called, I don't know, this and the other. There is foreign he said, exchange. Uh, he is not going to leave this country in the hands of thieves mm. because uh, he appreciates that uh, we are on the takeoff stage of uh, economic uh, recovery and we cannot entrust uh, the welfare of this country and the prospect of this country to people 
of questionable integrity. You know, the problem with that because statement that's another is issue. this. The problem with this statement is that this is a statement coming from the president. <laughs> and even if the president himself is as innocent as driven snow, mm. okay? If within his government that has happened, unfortunately, the buck stops with him. Unfortunately, it does. So we it's, can just say we are glad that he is living and we shall choose who we want to take over from him. It's not for him but to decide in all fairness, uh, who he wants to live it to. We it's appointed not uh, independent uh, <laughs> constitutional commissions uh, yes. and independent offices <laughs> yes. that are entrusted to fight graft. Uh. Let's yes. take a break So you now. cannot go back uh, and uh, <laughs> the person you we will take hyped this, off that uh, Let's take this break. We will so take this one after, after <laughs> that Let's one. take this break so long. <laughs> it's yes. 9 o'clock. Let's see what's happening on the roads. Good morning. <laughs> Spice up your life. 94.4 Spice FM. Nairobi. Right, uh, Campbell Road. Uh, there's a problem here. Also a shortage of public transport vehicle uh, vehicles there. Um, uh, so Kiambu Road is a mess, trying to then join with the Thika Super Highway. Still quite slow, looking a little bit better than it was about half hour ago. So we still see some traffic trying to get in and out of the CBD. Eastern, Southern Bypass is looking pretty good as well. Uh, getting into the CBD, then via Langata Road is not too bad right now. Okay, uh, no bumper to bumper situations around there just right now. We still see that there's a holdup of traffic then between the Nyaya Street and Roundabout and getting into the CBD. A little bit on Landy's Road, but shouldn't be too bad now. Still in the middle of traffic, I will take a look in about half hour see how that has changed talk to us if you need to if you get stuck somewhere let us know spice fmke on twitter text 40127 this is the situation room the home of hard-hitting political commentary and penetrating insights about the state of the nation. This is a talk radio experience like no other. The Situation Room, a place for hard truths, debates, and elevated conversations. The Situation Room, witty, political, engaging, deep, controversial. In the room, we have C.T. Muga, researcher, academic, seasoned political observer, a fountain of wisdom in these politically uncertain times. Ndu Oko, Nigerian by birth, Kenyan by choice, communications expert, pan-Africanist, a truth seeker and believer in people power, and Eric Latin. Agent provocateur, the man in the chair, seasoned journalist, news hound, a man who believes in punching up, not down. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. It's two minutes after nine. This is Kenya's biggest conversation, the Situation Room. We still have with us in the studio Solomon Kinodia, MCA, and Dendero Ward in Kembu County. Let's start the hour with today's proverb. Right, indeed. And... Here we go. If you carry an egg basket, do not dance. Solomon Kinodia, did you hear that? I, I get it. I get it. <laughs> mm -hmm. yes. If you carry an egg basket, <laughs> do not dance. I get the impression <laughs> that uh, Mushmiwa here is going against that particular proverb. Why? He's carrying an egg basket and he's dancing. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, with the exception that uh, if you're an expert dancer, you can dance. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I said this before you came. I understand. And also the assumption that there are actually eggs in this basket. Yes. <laughs> the, it may be an egg basket be, without eggs. Without without eggs. eggs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Going on to the conversation about BBI and the debates that are uh, going to be happening in the county assemblies today and in days to come. So let's just jump into the issue of the car grants. We had this conversation with you on uh, the phone a couple of days ago, yes. soon after the meeting with the president in Sagana. Yes. Uh, MCAs were promised this, and then swiftly we saw the Salaries and Remuneration Commission coming to say, oh, yeah, 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 this is actually possible. We've had a discussion with the county governments, and the Council of Governors have assured us that there's a way they can juggle the balls yes. until MCAs end up driving swanky brand new cars worth 2 million shillings. Then later we started seeing KRA wants to tax that money. Then now we are hearing Council of Governors saying, but you know, but you know, guys, uh, but the, so the, the money is not available like immediately. Yes. What's the situation like right now? Have you received your 2 million? Uh, not as yet. Huh? Mm. 
and um i would be highly circumspect discussing this issue because uh, there is a medical doctor from nyeri mm. who's uh, moved to nyeri high court and as uh, you know uh, nyeri high court uh, is a court of competent jurisdiction mm. and uh, the doctor that? because uh, we used to sue in nyeri high court uh, when we were a province in mm-hmm. central province mm-hmm. and we respect the nyeri high court mm. and we are ready to subject ourselves to whichever decision that the nyeri high court uh, would make mm-hmm. as regards uh, the car grant issue fine so we are waiting to hear the debate uh, or whatever um, submissions the doctor and uh, his lawyers uh, would have objecting to payment of the car grant and um, we are willing to accept uh, the outcome of that case mm. but as things stand uh, most of the assemblies that i know of have not paid the car grant mm. despite uh, an instruction from the saralis and remuneration commission instructing the clerks to release these payments because uh, in view of the council of governors uh, submission in view of the evaluation of the saralis and remuneration commission and in view of an earlier uh, petition to the presidency and uh, the cog by the county assembly's uh, forum mm. uh, the grant is uh, payable and uh, is legitimate but uh, since uh, it has been challenged uh, in a court of law uh, it's only fair that uh, we await uh, the outcome of uh, that uh, lawsuit you know where the problem arises and i'm using the word problem deliberately with this grant <laughs> is the timing of it that money a grant should be given to mcas i do not see an issue there this is something that should have been given a long time ago given what they do and the importance of their role which i think is often misunderstood and underestimated the timing of it um the timing is not uh, a subject uh, to the laws of the land and the constitution um we tried uh, to locate and uh, legitimize this issue in 2014 when i was not even in the county assemblies and uh, the county assemblies forum made a robust and a very justifiable uh, a claim for the car grant mm. just the subject that uh, the mcas uh, reminded the presidency of these uh, long outstanding issues uh, in uh, sagana and uh, the president promised to honor it um, well um, delay is not a denial it is true but you see delay here yes. or or yes. timing is, yes. is not so much the president's promise yes it starts with the meeting in sagana the import of it what was at stake even the gathering of all these leaders within that region mm. was part and parcel of a certain agenda that was being pursued so if at the end of the agenda as you correctly put it a long standing issue was resolved the issue because it's a political situation that we're talking about and political decisions have to be made unfortunately it invites question why now uh, when uh, is the ideal time uh, to settle actually, that issue actually the truth is this never the, the ideal time was in 2014 yes yes that was and, the ideal uh, time for reason unknown to us it was never settled mm. but uh, the national assembly uh, has been enjoying this and those are legislators legislators and just the senate like just like uh, those in the county assemblies and uh, mind you um the philosophy that i spoke about uh, from kibaki's uh, time mm. that we need to ac- ac- attract and retain the best in public service mm. is what informed uh the structuring of the mca saralis in 2013 and the su- subsequent uh, grant of uh, these vehicles in 2017 because Uh, who are we oversighting whose uh, registrative proposals are we looking into mm. look at the profile of the governors that we are supposed to oversight okay fine uh, this is not to say that uh, highly educated and experienced and exposed people cannot be corrupt so we are balancing that off in the interest of wanjiko the grassroots mm. who is the mca that you are dealing mca that would want to oversight somebody like uh, the lakipia governor who was a high official 
senior official in World Bank. Mm. Wangamati in uh, Western Kenya was again a very high ranking official in uh, uh, World Bank. Mm. Governor Nyoro in Kiambu, a highly experienced economist, a high ranking official in Rockefeller Foundation. Mm. Who are you attracting and who are you retaining to oversight the proposals and the spending of these high ranking officials? Professor Anyang Nyong taught uh, political science in uh, Mexico. Who are you equipping, who are you retaining, who are you attracting to oversight the doings and the undoings of Professor Nyang Nyong in Kisumu? The person we shall if retain if and hire is happy, the person who presents themselves yes. and then that person is picked by the people. Very well. But yeah. we would need somebody who's qualified to a certain extent to understand the policy proposals of Professor Nyang Nyong who taught uh, economic uh, policy in mm. Mexico, political science, He's come uh, here home. He's a high-ranking person. He's uh, formulated the Constitution of Kenya. Who are you equipping to registrate oversight and appropriate money for Professor Nyang Nyong to spend? And do you he think, should be do you somebody of that, comparable sure, qualifications. Do you think the people of Kenya are not able to make that selection upon those requirements that uh, you've talked about? You can make that selection, but mm. are you able to retain based on uh, your remuneration? Mm. So no, I can look at this panel and I can say, that uh, the Standard Media Group is attracting and retaining the best. <laughs> your, PR, <laughs> your PR is top notch. <laughs> Are you saying so low? So you cannot <laughs> present yourself. If you're not able to pay, <laughs> <laughs> no. If you're not able to pay and motivate the best, mm. how you're able to lock horns with the best in this country mm. and uh, question the public policy? Mm question uh, the inclination of politicians in the country. Mm. And I'm telling you, some of our politicians are the best there is in the world. We'll be concluding our conversation with you shortly, but we'll also be segueing into a conversation with the clinical officers. Yes. Health is devolved. Yes. Clinical officers are having a dispute with the count county governments. Yes. All right? Mm. So as very well retained, very well remunerated members of the county assembly, yes. What is it that ne needs to be done so that you can also retain very well and very highly qualified people who have gone through education and want to work as, as, uh, as clinical officers? And right now, they are on strike yes, for uh, very many days uh, because they don't feel all those things that you're saying. They're uh, not feeling very From well. the foremost, I would want uh, to admit that uh, I'm the chairperson of uh, the Health Services Committee in Kiambu County. Mm. And uh, we've resolved all outstanding labor issues with both the nurses and the clinic officers. Mm. And uh, for the doctors, Kiambu County is a destination of choice because uh, we try to motivate and attract and retain the best in the county. Tell us how you do this, Mwishmiu. We make sure that uh, there is room for growth, that uh, all requests for further education are approved, and we do this in line with the National Labor Union's uh, stipulations. If, um, for instance, currently, the labor unions have gone to court to challenge uh, the retention uh, clause because originally we had a retention clause of three years. Mm -hmm. So we are binding by the court ruling that uh, the bonding period of three years is uh, irregular. So we are allowing them to go and run, and if they would want to come back to Kiambu, fine, well and good. If they do not want to come back, well and good. We also allow them to choose the areas of specialization. We give them uh, risk allowances as a county. But we're having a problem with the national labor unions because uh, in the spirit of solidarity, even when we've abided by the demands of the local chapter of the labor union, they would still want, would want to stay away in solidarity with their national union colleagues. So to a large extent, um, our own uh, labor problems at the local level are informed by the national demands where we have no jurisdiction to point out those issues. Mm. But BBI comes in handy to address even the larger demands that the professionals working in counties would want to place on the county administration. How so? Because with 35% allocation as opposed to 15%. Mm. We are able now to go over and, and ab uh, over and above whatever requirements they would want to have for so long as they, they align with the law. 
And uh, this is not a problem unique to Kenya because in Nigeria, uh, the sharing between the national and the regional government is 50-50. Mm -hmm. So I wonder why people who are opposing 35 say it's not achievable and yet 50-50 is achievable in Nigeria and many other jurisdictions. Uh, in as much as uh, we are going into stimulation of uh, own source revenue and we're looking at ways in which uh, Trukana could get uh, a lot more from what uh, we are extracting from Trukana, Kilifi could get a lot more, Kuala could get a lot more from what we are getting from base titanium, it's only fair that uh, a large chunk of revenue goes back to the grassroots because spending at the grassroots is informed by local needs. Mm. And uh, there's a saying in commerce that uh, culture always takes strategy, strategy to breakfast. So local levels we have, we are to attuned to the culture. Mm. So whatever national strategy the national government has, we are going to take the national government strategy to breakfast when uh, money comes at the local <laughs> level. So <laughs> my take is 35 is attainable mm. and it's also not uh, at par with uh, African uh, benchmarks, uh, which is led by the, the greatest economy in Africa, which is Nigeria, which is giving 50% to the regional government. Mm. Mm. Yes, And that is going to enable us not just to attract uh, best doctors locally, even the people from Cuba, the doctors from Cuba who come and work in Kiambu when we have 35%. Mm. We are able to attract directly from Cuba. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Solomon Kinovia, thank you very much for joining us today. So, the vote at the county assembly, what time is it going to be? Uh, we are going to move uh, the notice uh, from 10. Mm -hmm. And then uh, at 2 p.m., we are going uh, to vote on the BBI. But I don't anticipate any problems mm. because uh, BBI is attuned to the local needs of the Mount Kenya region. And uh, we are going to have a Super Tuesday today. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Let me stretch mount. your imagination, if, you, if you'll allow me. <laughs> We've heard about Kiambu, but now you brought in what I wanted to ask you. Yes. The Mount Kenya region. Yes. Do you feel that all the other assemblies in the counties that represent or are representative of the Mount Kenya region think and feel the same way as you do? Exactly, because uh, our problems hmm. are pretty much uh, the same. The same eh? If it's about uh, the tea sector, uh, the coffee sector, the pyrethrum sector, the population problem, the population density, the youth disillusionment uh, with uh, people in government. Mm. All these issues are very similar. In uh, The problem with uh, drug abuse in the central Kenya region. Actually, I had a meeting with the uh, members of the county assembly of uh, Washingishu yesterday in a city hotel. Mm. And they also told me that uh, they are seriously considering voting for BBI. Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm. Okay. So BBI is just you, what the doctor ordered. For and you the think, <laughs> you think of the one million voters in Kiambu, yes. you think a million of them will vote for, will turn up to vote for the BBI? Okay. Come the 100 percent. Actually, I've uh, said it uh, in black and white that uh, if in the Nder ward and in the Raja Kiambu constituency, BBI fails, mm. I will not be presenting myself for re-election in 2022. Because this will be a referendum people, on you. Your yes, my people would have, have failed me. Mm. Because the problems they the present to me... Yes. <laughs> and not the other was, way around, that you would have failed the people. I, I was able to codify <laughs> those problems <laughs> and contribute to the BBI, mm. which is a solution maker. Mm. Okay. And they have rejected what I have prescribed. Mm. So as a doctor to the problems in the grassroots, my qualification will be of uh, doubt. <laughs> thank you very much Solomon <laughs> we hope to have you again soon uh, in the com coming days after yes, this uh, particular vote uh, I'm, I'm happy for you uh, hosting me and uh, next time I hope to keep time yes. Yes. and uh, that's a problem of development because we are doing the airport uh, Westlands uh, mm. or, True. Uh, what is it called uh, Expressway, Expressway. Yes. that has caused uh, all this delay Yes. Mm. but we thank God uh, for this kind of development and we hope to see more with the BBI. As you go along with, with the, the BBI. With the BBI. <laughs> <laughs> 18 minutes after 9. Good morning. This is the Situation Room. The only way to start your day. Spice up your life.
La 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 Japan Biotechnology Yes Hey Samuel Are you into business now? What are you importing from Japan? Knowledge I'm going to study biotechnology in the best university in Japan I applied and ta-da Hmm Japan? Yes You want to first learn Japanese? No my friend They have more than 850 courses that are provided in English and very affordable Hey Ay 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 How do I apply? <laughs> Kuja Osome Japan Study in Japan Global Network Project brings you an opportunity to study in Japan. Log on to www.studyinjapan-africa.com and apply to study in Japan with over 100 universities providing cutting-edge science and technology courses including the field of robotics, artificial intelligence, AI, environmental studies, information technology and many more. Not only postgraduate but undergraduate level is also covered. Mention our course, you will not fail to get it. Visit our website today on www.studyinjapan-africa.com Have you seen the... Am I live? Uh, yes, yes. It's a very nice uh, outfit, I must mm. say. Good thank job. you. Asante sana. The compliment is well received. Good morning and thank you. Evan Nwasingishi was asking me what channel is Spice FM. <laughs> 96.7. <laughs> Tell them that. Right. Yes, now they know. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Pleasure to have what you. What a beautiful friend. studio, my friend. <laughs> I've been to other radio stations, but I've never seen anything like this. Thank you. Thank you. And it's very nice to be in a modern studio. Absolutely <laughs> brilliant. And I have to say, uh, it's a very cool ambiance here in your uh, radio room. Uh, just for our listeners, I think it is uh, below zero in this uh, room here. A very Swiss temperatures. The weather with Spice FM. All right, Nairobi, mostly cloudy at 21 degrees. We'll see highs of 25 today. Nyeri is mostly cloudy at 20, highs of 23. 24 the high in Nakuru, mostly cloudy at 20. 20 is mostly cloudy in Eldoret. 22 the high and lows of 13. We'll see highs of 29 in Kisumu today. It's mostly cloudy at 22. It's 22 in Kakamega as well. Mostly cloudy going to highs of 25 and lows of 15. Mostly cloudy conditions in Mombasa. 29, highs of 32. 31 will be the high in Malindi. Light rain this morning. Mostly cloudy conditions in Kampala, highs of 27 and lows of 19. It's mostly cloudy in Dar es Salaam at 25, highs of 29. Johannesburg will see highs of, of 23 today. There's still a haze over the Lagos skies at 26, highs of 34 and lows of 26. And mostly sunny in Kinshasa at 24, highs of 31 and lows of 23. Let's go east, looking into Beijing. It's still snow over the city at 3, highs of just that and lows of minus 4. It's warmer in Paris today at 13, highs of 18 and lows of 9. Clear conditions in London at 7, highs of 13 and lows of 11. And finally, it's clear now in New York, going into Tuesday morning, 3 degrees at the moment. Highs of 6, lows of 1. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4. First two minutes after nine. This is Kenya's biggest conversation, the Situation Room. Thank you very much for keeping it here in the room. You have City Muga Nduoko, Eric Latif. We are now joined by the chairman of the Kenya Union of Clinical Officers, Peterson Washira. He's in the studio. Good morning, Peterson. Good morning. Good to see you. Thank you. Good to see you too. Uh, welcome and to the to Situation Room. You know, I was looking at you and wondering, why is this person familiar? <laughs> <laughs> you have only seen me virtually. More than once. And I was thinking, this yeah, person, yeah, yeah. where did you meet? I even started thinking, <laughs> am I related to this person? Because it's, yeah. it's, it's only when I meet relatives, I'm thinking, I know this relative, but what's his name? Karibu Sana Peterson. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> and thank you for visiting us today. Thank you. Clinical officers are still on strike. Uh, so yesterday, mm -hmm. uh, the court ordered us back to work. Mm -hmm. But now therein lies the problem. Mm -hmm. That we have been ordered back to work, but then whatever took us out of work has not been addressed. Mm -hmm. And whatever took us out of the workplaces is unsafe working environment mm -hmm. that presents imminent risk to our health as medics. And of course, if, if it presents a risk to our health, it also does to the patient. Mm. And so we are not out of the woods. Mm. Though we are going back, 
in obedience of the court order, that does not guarantee that you are going to have uninterrupted services in the hospitals. <laughs> hmm. So you'll go back, but you may not work. What I'm trying to say is, <laughs> the reason as to why we left the working station mm. was in compliance of Section 14 of the Occupation of Safety and Health Act mm. that says that when an employee, in his opinion or her opinion, feels that the working environment presents imminent risk to their health, they are mandated by law to vacate after reporting to the immediate supervisor and not to resume duty mm. until the environment is remedied. So we vacated because the working environment was unsafe. We are going back. If we do not have the protective gear that we went out looking for, if the environment is not conducive, mm. then the law tells us we cannot subject ourselves to harm when we know, and we, it's a matter of logic. And so when we do not have these protective gears, then we, we shall not work. Mm. But court, when we have them, mm. we will, of course, work. When the court was ordering you back to work, was it interim order or was it after hearing what, you are, what your reasons were? They were interim orders. Uh, that were issued uh, yesterday. Mm -hmm. The case is still ongoing. And uh, we hope that in the fullness of time, that uh, the court will be able to actually determine that we were, the, we were right, because it's the employers who actually took us to court. Mm. But now the problem is, uh, at that time when the judgment or the ruling is going to be made, it will be too late. Whoever who will have been affected or have died from COVID-19 as a health worker because they were not protected, the best a court can say is that you, the employer, you didn't give the protection that you are supposed to give. But we will not be able to resurrect that person. Mm. So the damage will be done. And I think um, it is neglect on the part of the employers, and that is the county governments, because they are the ones which actually refused to uh, dialogue, to come to the conciliation table mm. and negotiate a framework to ensure that they remedy the working uh, environment. Because the national government under the Ministry of Health signed a return to work agreement that basically provided for a framework that uh, provides on how we were going together to remedy the situation to ensure that no other medic um, dies uh, from the same. But for the county governments, because uh, they felt that um, some of the items, probably the, the ones that uh, they, 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 in their press conference they said they did not agree with, then they decided to throw everything out, to throw the baby with the bathwater. Peterson, may, let me ask you this question. Yes. One of the other things that the county governors pointed out was something, funds. Mm. So... From one perspective, you could argue that the national government was throwing the county government under the bus. You sign this thing, but they need funding from the national government to be able to do these very same things that Deep are science. at the heart of the discussion. Mm -hmm. now, if these funds are not, uh, were not available, how then are these county governments supposed to enact these things? I think what the county governments uh, brought out to the public was what I would call a convenient narrative. Mm -hmm. If you look at the details of the return to work agreement, it actually does acknowledge that. Mm -hmm. And it says that the money is to come from the treasury to fund whatever was to be funded. It was not to come from the counties or from the uh, county allocation because in that allocation there was no consideration of what would come after. So that was taken into account and uh, if you remember, at the start of this crisis, uh, the chairman then, the former chair, the Council of Governors, came out and said that though we know the grievances, the concerns by the health workers are valid, we as the counties, we do not have the capacity mm -hmm. because we don't have funds. And he said, uh, we want to plead with the national government to help us. And that is what informed the Ministry of Labor to constitute a multi-agency uh, team, uh, standing, standing committee, which actually basically represented every other department in government mm. that would be involved in making such a decision mm. that sat, deliberated, 
uh, made uh, its conclusion and reduced it into the return to work framework that we signed with the CS uh, Ministry of Health after the chair council of governors giving his okay and the chair labor that they have seen the document and they are okay, they were going to sign later. Only for them to go back and refuse. Why do you think they went back, mm. in your opinion? Uh, really speaking, I do not understand. They explained that they went back because they took it to the other governors. And the other governors in a full council meeting said, absolutely no way. You are not going to sign this on our behalf because we do not agree. Can you fault them for that? Yes, of As course. a chair of the Council of Governors, you represent the other 46 governors. Mm. And if the other 46 governors unanimously in a council meeting come and tell you, what we are reading here, we have issues with, we do not approve, you cannot sign. I, I, I think therein lies the problem mm -hmm. that for the Council of Governors, um, when it's convenient, the Council of Governors represents all of them. When it's not convenient, then the Council of Governors cannot make a decision on behalf of the 47 county governments. When we were being invited by the CS Labour for the conciliation meetings under the multi-agency, it was very clear in the letter. Mm. Send representatives with the capacity and the mandate to make decisions on the table. Mm -hmm. If at that point they felt that the people to be sent by the Council of Governors were not people they can be able to trust with that, then they should have said that each and every county wants to send one person. I think honestly, on Peterson, table. this is a just, it's, it's a leadership issue, right? Yes. You, as the chair of the Union of Clinical Officers, if you signed that and then your members came and started telling you, no, 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 Peterson, we disagree, what are you to do? You renege on what you've signed. You'd say, I have gone back to the membership and the members who sent me here with the authority to come and negotiate, have gone and said, absolutely not. I wouldn't agree. <laughs> because uh, then it, it means that uh, it's a failure of leadership, as you're saying. It's an issue of leadership, but the issue is failure. Because you're supposed to involve your people at every stage of the negotiation, of the discussion. Mm -hmm. And even at the onset, you are supposed to have agreed what are we as a group willing uh, to let go, what are we willing to give. Yep. And so there won't be such issues where you go back and they tell you that uh, one, two, three that you have signed we actually don't agree with. Then the other question is, if you look at uh, the doctor's uh, agreement, which was signed also by the Council of Governors, mm. they're almost basically the same, except for the risk allowance, mm. which they were not, uh, which didn't seem to be a bigger issue to them. So what was the difference between the clinical officers and the doctors where they were able to sign? The when did allowance. they realize... The risk allowance is a when, when did they realize mm. that um, the Council of Governors does not have the mandate? If you're talking about the risk allowance, and uh, uh, you know sometimes in this country, and uh, I'm not political, mm. but I think it's and, our and business. Hold, it, hold it, hold it, hold it. Uh, allow yes. me to just pause there. You lead a union. Yes. And you're not political. Yes. Okay. I'm a unionist, not a politician. And, then, <laughs> and, then, and the difference is... <laughs> anyway, please carry on. Yes. Yeah, so, so what I'm trying to say is that in this country, for a common, hardworking Kenyan, it is very difficult to negotiate anything. Mm. Why? But for politicians, it becomes very easy. It looks like a peer negotiation. Mm. If you look at uh, what we were added as clinic officers, in each year, it would cost this country 900 million, which is actually a drop in the ocean. Mm. We have just seen the MCAs being given 4.5 billion after. The SRC, which is supposed to be independent, uh, told us that there was no money and mm. it was not sustainable. Mm. But when it came to the MCAs, they said the money was there <laughs> and they can actually be given. It was found. Mm. Yeah, I think as, uh, as Kenyans, sometimes we need to ask the questions. Peterson, since we're talking of questions, there's something I want to ask. It's actually yes. there are two questions, not one. One, when we talk to members of this Council of Governors, 
One of the things that some of the members have told us is that medical workers, health workers, are very well remunerated as compared to other health workers, say, around us here mm. within East Africa, maybe on the continent. Question one, how true is that? Okay, you'll come and answer that. Let's take a break, see what's happening on the roads. And then you'll respond to this particular question. We have in the studio Peterson Washira. He's the chairman of the Kenya Union of Clinical Officers. He's telling us why the clinical officers are not happy with a court order that directs them to resume work. Good morning. This is Kenya's biggest conversation, the Situation Room. This is the Situation Room, the only way to start your day. Spice up your life. La, 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 la. Japan, biotechnology, yes! Hey, Samuel, are you into business now? What are you importing from Japan? Knowledge! I'm going to study biotechnology in the best university in Japan. I applied and ta-da! Hmm, Japan? Yes! You will have to first learn Japanese. No, my friend. They have more than 850 courses that are provided in English and very affordable. Hey, aye, aye, aye. how do I apply? <laughs> Kuja Osome Japan. Study in Japan Global Network Project brings you an opportunity to study in Japan. Log on to www.studyinjapan-africa.com and apply to study in Japan. With over 100 universities providing cutting-edge science and technology, courses including the field of robotics, Robotics, artificial intelligence, AI, environmental studies, information technology, and many more. Not only postgraduate, but undergraduate level is also covered. Mention our course, you will not fail to get it. Visit our website today on www.studyinjapan-africa.com. Guys, in Gong Road, a little bit of traffic then as you head towards the city motorway roundabout uh, and then out towards Valley Road or going towards Bagadi Way. Shouldn't be too bad thereafter. Coming off of Huru Highway into the city uh, from the nearest Stadium roundabout, also looking um, a lot better now, still slow. You can use the bypass, the southern bypass, to get into the CBD. Longer route, yes, but you won't be stuck in too much traffic. All right. Uh, getting out of traffic, are, we shouldn't have too many problems out now. But uh, thicker road still an issue. Let's have a look at that through the day and see how it opens up. Talk to us if you need to. Spice of MKE on Twitter. Text 40127. Are you ready? Okay. Spice FM. Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Mornings done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. Three minutes to 10 o'clock. The conversation continues with Peterson Washira of the Kenya Union of Clinical Officers. So you've been directed to go back to work and you still say, the reason why we went, uh, we were downing our tools is because we felt unsafe in our workplace and we uh, have reason to do to go on strike on those grounds. However, the court has ordered you to go back to work. Now, before we went to the break, City was asking you, governors have said, and they've, you know, even come up with tabulation, how much we pay our healthcare workers in this country, you cannot compare to how much healthcare workers are paid regionally. How much we pay our healthcare workers in our counties, you cannot compare with how much we pay other cadres of professionals in the same county. What do you say to that? Um, I think um, the only way you can be able to compare pay is if you are going to do an analysis of the job done and then you can be able now to compare. SRC has been mandated to do that. Mm -hmm. SRC has twice uh, done an, a job analysis on the health workers and everybody else. I haven't uh, heard anywhere SRC say that we are uh, overpaid. Mm -hmm. Then, what do they mean by comparing with others? Most of the private facilities are paying almost double what we are paid in the government facilities. Mm -hmm. So there must be some uh, criteria you use for comparison. For example, a governor in Kenya is paid more than the, the, the president of the Somaliland. Should we say that the governor in Kenya is overpaid? Yes. Mm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, there yes. must be a criteria that you look at to then say that um, comparing the work done by this one and this other one, mm -hmm. 
then this one is uh, paid above whatever they're supposed to be paid. But uh, on the face of it, we cannot be able to do this. If you look at it, we have so many medics who are leaving government employment, going into private, and others even going overseas. Mm -hmm. If we were very well paid compared to other jurisdictions, do we have where would others they be going? who actually leave private uh, business to come into government? Yes, we do have. Why, do, why is that move then? You see, either sides, they have their benefits and they have their disadvantages. Mm. Yes. If you are in the government employment, the chances of you furthering your education, getting the study leaves, the job security, that is what attracts people towards the government, not the money. In the private sector, you'll have the money, that, but probably you may not have that time to go back to school. They may not even sponsor you. So it's because of that growth that uh, you, you evaluate. And uh, we, you know, uh, I think there is this um, a notion that has been created that medics love money and we follow money. <laughs> mm, some do. Uh, just you're like kidding. all other human beings, some do. If medics <laughs> move themselves out of the human race, then what you're saying would apply 100%. But so long as they're human beings and they're Kenyans, yes, there are those who pursue money and they love pursuing money at the risk of even their own jobs like mm. other Kenyans do. Now, what I'm saying, I'm not saying that medics do not appreciate good money, but what I'm saying, it's not the sole thing that mm. we look for. When I joined government, wherever I was, I was earning much more. Mm. But I joined the government because of other issues, because I want to further my uh, career. I want mm -hmm. to specialize and probably sub-specialize. But Peter, doesn't this balance it? I mean... So the government is an attractive employer? Yes. Depending on what you are looking for as a medic. Actually, we are taking that into consideration yes. and we are saying, given that the government is, is in fact, the largest employer. Mm. No, it isn't. Of medics? It isn't. Who is the largest employer? The private sector and the mission and the NGOs. Comparatively, give it a ratio. Mm. What does the government employ? What percentage does the government employ? I and can give you a ratio employ? with clinic officers. Give mm -hmm. me clinical officers. Right now, we are about 25,000 registered clinic officers in this country. Yes. Mm -hmm. In government, we are only about 7,000. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. All the others are in NGOs, private sector. And, and the assuming others. that they're active, right? They are active. Okay. Because you cannot be retained. You cannot be given a retention license mm -hmm. if you are not practicing. Okay. Uh, How do you explain this, Peterson? Mm. How do you explain this situation? Why are they more? Does the same apply for, uh, to the nurses? Does yes. it apply to medical doctors? Yes. Do we have more facilities in the private sector, mission, and NGO? Than we have uh, than in, in the in government? Public? Um, I have not done that analysis, but I would assume so because, of course, uh, where they are working. Yep. But uh, the problem that we have on the government side is that we have a, 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 a severe shortage of uh, human resource mm -hmm. that uh, the government does not seem to be in a hurry to address. Mm. Because if you look at some of the guidelines that have been produced by the ministry itself, like in 2014, they made something they call staffing norms and standards that provides for each facility should have how many nurses, clinic officers, doctors, and the others. And according to it, by 2018, we were supposed to actually have 16,148 clinic officers in the public sector. Mm. Now we are talking about universal health coverage that of course means you have to get access nearer to where you are. Yeah. But then we are not even doing a half, half of, of the, the staffing norms and standards, not according to us, mm. according to the government itself. Mm. And so it's a problem, uh, the same that we are facing, of the neglect of the health sector. That is why we are having fewer because they are not being employed in government. And so they either have to open their facilities because the need for services is there mm. or they have to be employed by others who open those facilities outside there. Mm. Peterson, it's the same government that has made it possible for all this to happen. Wouldn't you agree? Yes, it is. Because it isn't as though clinical mm. officers and nurses could open their own practices. The government allowed this. We Kenyans allowed this. Actually... <laughs> I'm trying very hard to balance this. Yeah. And you're trying very hard to ensure that the government gets no credit for anything. 
No, no, it's not that. Yes. It's actually that, uh, you know, there, there is a very bad notion we have as Kenyans that has been created by politicians. Even for the constitution, it looks as if it's for the government to be able to administer to the people. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, even the constitution, I think the opening statements are we the people. The sovereign power. Yes, the mm. sovereign power lies with we the people. Mm. And even for that MP who is making that act of parliament to allow us to open these facilities, mm. we have delegated our power as the Wanjikos and Atienos, and uh, I don't know why they never say Kemanis, mm. so that uh, we can give them power to go and enact laws on our behalf mm. and enable us to facilitate the services that have been given as a right by the constitution. If you look at the constitution, the right to the highest attainable standards of health under Article 43, we give ourselves as Kenyans. We then uh, delegated our powers to this legislature uh, le 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 yeah. to go to parliament to enact laws to facilitate attainment of this right. Mm. And so, when they do that... Mm. It's not the government that is doing this. It's <laughs> we the people. It's we the people. Mm -hmm. Yes. So then at what point then do we blame the government? So when the <laughs> money doesn't come to you, so we, the, we people. the people have not given ourselves money. Is that it? No, we the people have given our taxes. We yes. the people have, but uh, the, have given but laws the, that have adopted but, Abuja but, declaration. But, but the allocation, the allocation of, yes. of that. Relevantly. You see, I don't want this chicken and egg situation. Yes. But the point I'm trying to ask is, are health workers paid a livable wage compared to other Kenyans who are employed within the private or the public sector? A livable wage? Yes. Um, I think that will be very relative. It's to supposed to be relative. And yes. subjective. Mm. And so that is not something that I can be able to say about all the health workers. What I would say is that comparatively, Whatever the health workers are paid currently in terms of the health risk allowance is not commensurate with the risk they suffer. So, with this clamor that has been going on when we're talking about going on six months now, yes. um, with all of this happening, has it, has it borne the desired fruit? whether it was to get people to sit up and pay attention, whether it was to get more um, in your hands in terms of now power to be able to wiggle about a little bit. Has it borne its fruit? Has it? I would say that uh, it hasn't as yet. Mm. And uh, because of the same problem that uh, the politicians did not want it. Mm. Um, we came out when we were told that uh, we have a constitutional moment. For us, we are very happy as mm. the medics. Mm. Because since devolution, I think there has been an outcry from ourselves that there is a problem with the how health care is governed in this country. Mm. And so when the BBI task force was put in place, we went before them, we presented memorandums mm -hmm. and medics, and we said that we need to reform the health sector so that it can work for us. And we asked for a health service commission. And that was not just because we love a commission or we would want to come out of the counties. It was because we have looked at the other critical sectors, be it the police, the judiciary, uh, the teachers, and we saw that from the onset, they were considered to have a body that manages the human resource to ensure that um, uh, they, you do not have service interruptions. And that is why we were asking, why can't we have the same for the health sector so that we can have people who are dedicated, who are not politicians, mm. so that they can have technical solutions that improves quality, not political solutions that benefits political outcomes. Ndugu Peterson. Yes. Right now as we speak, have you considered the drawbacks that a commission may have? You're talking about the benefits. Yes. Have you considered? We have considered. And, and, what, uh, and what conclusion did you arrive at? That the benefits would outweigh. outweigh. Okay. Yeah. Who would appoint this commission? Of course, um, the president would appoint probably the chairman. Right. Yes. Secretary General or Secretary, as they are called, of the commission? Uh, according to how it was to be structured, they were to come from some institutions. 
Okay. From the Ministry of Health, from the Council of Governors, and the Human Resource. You know why I'm asking this question? Look at yes. the tussle that the TSC has with KNUT. Mm. There are those who argue that TSC is actually being used to kill KNUT. There are those who argue KNUT killed themselves. Mm. There are those who argue Kupet was being used to kill... Well, there are arguments galore. Yes. Now, I am saying, the moment you have a commission, and that's why I asked you who the appointing officers are, mm. do you think you could be jumping from the frying pan into the fire? I think uh, that is a valid argument. And uh, what I would say is, for us as health workers, uh, we took an oath to protect life. So what we look at first is, is that patient on the other end going to get that quality? We believe with the HSC, with the Health Service Commission, that the patient will benefit more because there won't be service interruptions. Mm. Would the Health Service Commission be used uh, to cripple unions? I think it would at some point. As they are doing now, even when we're in the counties, you know that they have stopped the deductions to mm. cripple us as the unions. Mm. That uh, is something that we know that ca could happen. And as union, at any given time, we know that the government at some point, uh, they are strategizing on how to cripple us. Mm. Th that, is, that is something that we live with. So I agree that that is a very valid argument. But for the sake of Wanjiko, and getting the quality services uninterrupted, mm. I think a health service commission so would actually be better. Will will come from from having a health services commission. Yes. And the cut and rat situation mm. between the commission and the unions will still exist. It will still exist <laughs> even without a health service commission. I can assure you, it will still be there. Mm. Yes. Let's take a break. Another break at ten minutes to ten. We are having a conversation with Peterson Washira. He's the chairman of the Kenya Union of Clinical Officers. If you'd like to ask him a question, you can post your questions on social media. Spice FM KE on YouTube, on Facebook, and Twitter. And let's see if we can open just the phone line uh, for one question. Good morning. La 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 Japan Biotechnology Yes! Hey, Samuel, are you into business now? What are you importing from Japan? Knowledge! I'm going to study biotechnology in the best university in Japan. I applied and ta-da! Hmm, Japan? Yes! You will have to first learn Japanese. No, my friend. They have more than 850 courses that are provided in English and very affordable. Hey, aye, aye, aye. How do I apply? <laughs> <laughs> Kuja Osome Japan. Study in Japan Global Network Project brings you an opportunity to study in Japan. Log on to www www.studyinjapan-africa.com and apply to study in Japan with over 100 universities providing cutting-edge science and technology courses including the field of robotics, artificial intelligence, AI, environmental studies, information technology and many more. Not only postgraduate but undergraduate level is also Spice FM Nakuru Mature, intelligent talk every morning. Spice up yourself. Done right. 94.4 Spice FM, Nairobi. Shira, the chairman of the Kenya Union of Clinical Officers. Um, plight of healthcare workers in the country. We've been talking about the Health Services Commission, which is uh, not among those that are in the BBI recommendation. So what are you as a union saying? Yes or no to this BBI? I think I don't want to get into the conversation of whether we are supporting or not. Because as unions, what we do, mm. we cannot be aligned to any faction. Oh. Because uh, we, we negotiate with the government of the day, whichever government is going to come in. And we give our members uh, a free space to be able to make their decision. But what I can say is that in the BBI that we are having now, it does not answer the question of we know that we have had a problem with the health sector mm. since it was devolved. We have had more than 100 strike notices since 2013, while after independence up to 2010, we only had two strikes. Peterson, did you dare have strikes in that particular era? 
<laughs> in the time of President Moi and the time of President Kenyatta, Nikala and his group were the first people to actually do something serious, and the consequences were dire. Yes. They went on strike for six months. And the consequences were dire. People were chased out of houses. People yes. had to move. Uh, uh, but they opened the path to what is now being enjoyed. Mm. Sure. Yes. I agree. So if you look at it, I, I think what it means is that um, if we only had two strikes then, and we <laughs> have over 100 strikes, between issued then and now, hundred and three. between actually. 2013 and now, hundred and three. It yeah. tells you that after devolution, there is a problem. There is a challenge that came with devolution. Probably yes, but probably also, we are seeing the the benefits of operationalizing devolution, meaning you actually do have an opportunity to have a voice where previously you didn't dare have a voice. Now you have a voice. And having that voice is what all these things you're saying. It's mm -hmm. a manifestation of the openness of this system that we have. That is not a negative thing. When the president, uh, the, the that president of this country took power, His Excellency Moi Kibaki, he gave free space mm. Mm. for everyone to be able to voice. Why didn't we have strikes then? You are still getting used to the idea. <laughs> Teachers went on strike, my friend. That, that it would hadn't be sunk <laughs> in yet that this freedom was actually there. That would me be me there. Mentally, psychologically, you are still mm. in the past and you're testing a little bit. Are we okay? Okay, this one, nothing has happened. Let's try again. Okay, nothing has happened. Next, they registered the union. Next. And then, remember, <laughs> the implementation of this constitution came with Uhuru. Uhuru is. Yes, President Uhuru is the one who has felt the full brunt of it. Mm -hmm. No other president has. Now, I think what I'm trying to say is that uh, if you look at the time of Kibaki and the time of Uhuru, the space for us to be able to voice and go on strike has been similar. Actually, in, Ki in Kibaki times, it was better. And it has it borne fruit? Uh, I think in Kibaki times, it was better. And does it, with the strikes Why that we've seen... Why do you say it was seen, better? With the strikes that we've seen and yes. the engagement that we've seen, 103 strikes yes. in seven years. Yes. Has it gotten to the point whereby you say, okay, in order for us to get something done mm -hmm. and for us to be listened to, a strike then needs to come in place and then we get, the f we get it, what it, we're actually looking for. Mm -hmm. Has it really worked? Now, I think there has been some improvements that have been brought about by the strikes. Like? Like uh, some of the improvements in the health facilities. Yes. The training of medics. Mm. Uh, to specialties and subspecialties, which of course translates uh, to quality of the services down there. But those were always and, there before. And even the UHC, no, they weren't. Mm. So few. Medics used to be sponsored by the government to be trained, brother. Uh, unless maybe I'm, maybe I'm, what I would, uh, I would ask is, uh, maybe I'm living in another country. Maybe what or maybe I would you need ask, to be specific. Uh, yes, like uh, if I can ask, uh, maybe for specialties. How many neurosurgeons probably did we have before 2000? How many neurosurgeons <laughs> did we even need at independence? Uh, no, I'm saying uh, uh, by 2000, that was there's so a reason, many years. There's after. a reason why I've thrown you back to that time. I'm yeah. simply saying, yeah. with the passage of time, you expect improvements. Mm. Because new needs come about. Mm. Forget subspecialties, sub subspecialties. Maybe what mm. he's saying is with the passage but, of time and the requirement for improvements, it was not commensurate with the time. But with the unions. That does not apply to this country. Now, that started happening more vigorously. Oh, I do not doubt. Uh, because we're talking about the function and the effectiveness of unions. Unions are important. I, I'm not doubting that whatsoever. They are important. Uh -huh. What I am asking Peterson here is, Peterson, the reality of our situation and yeah. asking you as a medic, how do you balance this issue of the oath that you take yes. and going on strike. Let me explain why I'm asking the question. Yeah. Yes, you have problems, but then you put more lives at stake when you go on strike. Mm. Yet, you're trying to prevent your people who are in the front line mm. from actually putting their lives at stake. How do you balance this? Good. As we conclude. You know, our oath, I took an oath saying that I will do whatever I can to protect lives. That whatever I can includes uh, vacating the working place. If I'm posing more harm to the patient who is coming to me than giving them the cure. That is protecting their lives.
And in this context, <laughs> we were actually the super spreaders. No, it's very true. We mm. were actually the super spreaders of COVID. Mm. You would note that after, uh, after actually we went on strike, Medic stopped dying and even the cases went down. <laughs> That's it, Sam. Peterson, people didn't start going to hospitals because there was nobody to take care of them. <laughs> so you couldn't hospital. know whether people were dying or not from but, public hospitals. But, but doctors the testing did not labs die. were open and the mission hospitals and the privates were there. Really? <laughs> so if somebody was really sick, they would be taken to a hospital somewhere. You are not a politician, Peterson. <laughs> no, he's not a politician. Yeah. No, he's not. Mm. He's a union leader. Mm. You're just a union leader who yeah. speaks yeah. politically. Yes. <laughs> Thank you very much for joining us today, Peterson Mashira. We hope you. to have you again soon. Eh? Thanks a lot and thanks for giving me a chance to be in the Situation Room. Thank you. Thank you for the good work you're doing. Asante. Thank you, Peterson. City, today's proverb. Right, right, right. Peterson, this one, I think you need to tell us what you think. Yeah. If you carry the egg basket, do not dance. Mm. It means that if you dance, they might spill over and break. Yes. Or, or even break in the, ba basket. In the basket. Yes. Mm. That's it. Thank you very much for